Happy Monday. Welcome to the Scoop World Order. It is Monday. We are ready to grind. There's a ton of stuff going on right now. We got our first Michigan Wolverine to transfer to Ohio State this offseason. Are there more coming? We're going to get into that. And we're also going to get into uh, some of the uh, comings and goings with the 10th coach. Uh, there's an interview taking place in the next day or so. It'll uh, be interesting to see how that goes uh, in regards to James Laurinaitis. We're going to talk a little bit about um, why Chip Kelly left, uh, some of his impact so far. No meeting with the team as of yet, so we're going to get into uh, what's his impact going to be. Uh, they start mat drills, winter conditioning, Wednesday and Friday. Those are really grimy, gritty workouts, so we're going to show you kind of what those are um, and a whole lot more and take your questions. As always, uh, we appreciate you guys. Get the Super Chats fired up. The Super Chats are huge. We've signed up a ton of new members this weekend uh, for people for Pay It Forward. A lot of, uh, we've got former uh, retired military, active military, uh, state troopers, police officers. We appreciate you guys. Thank you for protecting our country and protecting us. So again, this is a little way for everyone to, to um, pay it forward. And we appreciate that. Um, all of our super chats and all of our ultra memberships go towards this fund. And it's been uh, gangbusters. So we have a lot of new Buckeye Scoop members. Thanks to you guys uh, for taking care of the people that take care of us. They have a very thankless job and we're very, better, we're very much benefited by their sacrifices. Uh, and uh, additionally, uh, if you guys could leave a like on this video, that is always huge. Click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. Uh, the alert bell will let you know when we go live. Generally, it's around 7 o'clock. Sometimes it fluctuates, but generally we're going to be around 7 in the off season. So thank you so much. And uh, shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. And uh, let's, uh, let's get riding. Nevada. Um, Joey Velasquez. This was an interesting one. This is a kid. Uh, he's from DeSales. Not a lot of stats. Uh, he's a uh, grad student. Now, he's a six-year guy. So if we can get anything out of him from a special teams perspective, um, that'd be great. But transferred to Ohio State. Was a two-sport guy um, in high school. Really good two-sport guy. Uh, again, I, I think it'll be interesting to see uh, what he's going to do. But I, I always, again, the Borens, you know, had a very, very successful business, uh, grass groomers and um they uh they they kind of parlay that they sold grass grooms off. They still have the dumpster business, um, but I feel like Justin Bourne coming back, and then Zach and Jacoby going there. It was a boon for their business. I feel before I could like Joey to go to grad school here and play one year at Ohio State. It kind of washes away the stench of being a Michigan Wolverine turncoat. Um, you know the kid hasn't done much on the football field. He's probably a better baseball player. Um, but your thoughts on a, another Michigan Wolverine transferring to Ohio State? We've been alluding to that. Um, are there going to be more? Well, it's interesting. You know, when something happens, the, 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 I saw that is that it's the first time this has happened since 08. Um, I, so I found that to be, that was pretty notable. But what was interesting was just talking to people you know, close to Joey because we, we've been hearing about this for a while. This has been out there for a yeah. little bit and talking to people. And I they just keep saying it's a mess, that Michigan is just a complete an un unadulterated mess right now and that nobody knows who's in charge nobody knows what's going on everybody feels deceived but you know the players are kind of hanging in there now because you know they, they look they were the national champion i mean it's really rare for kids just to leave on moss from a defending national champion but i think that's the only thing that's keeping this thing from being an avalanche right now is those set of circumstances because all the coaches that recruited these guys are gone all the coaches that told them they would never leave are gone. And it's a, a bunch of inexperienced guys, and they're kind of running around trying to keep it together. But uh, according to Joey's, like, just, uh, like I said, I just, I, I just kept hearing, it's just such a mess. You have no idea what a disaster it is up there in Ann Arbor right now. And uh, I just found that hysterical. And, and certainly something, you know, you would expect the, the honeymoon – for national championship to at least last a little while, you know, like maybe at least till spring football, but I've never seen anything like, I've never seen a program completely implode like this one has in, in the space of you know, four weeks, three weeks, whatever it's been. Um, it's notable. It's amazing. And it, and it couldn't happen to a better bunch of guys. Yeah. And, and I, I, I've seen it. I lived it. And I mean, in 2010, obviously when we had Terrell and Tress, um, you know, we go 12 and one, your only loss is camp Randall against JJ Watt, a good Wisconsin team that went to the Rose bowl, um, on the road. That was a tough loss. Um, 12 and one win the sugar bowl, um, want to share the big 10 that year. Uh, so we got rings for that season and then, you know, Jim Trestle, you know, gets, gets whacked and all of a sudden, 
we're six and seven. We also lost Terrell. Obviously, you know, a quarterback and a head coach, especially when it's a quarterback is a difference maker like Terrell was, it can, you know, the 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 magic eraser of having a great quarterback all of a sudden um no longer exists. And I think that you know, I think Jim Harbaugh and JJ McCarthy are probably on that level. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, Terrell I think is a better athlete than JJ, but JJ is projected to be a top fifteen pick and you know, Terrell's a supplemental guy that went, you know, I think second or third, I think third round. So, I mean, by definition, based on NFL draft projections, JJ is probably viewed as a better NFL player potentially um, than Terrell was. But, you know, and, and Jim Harbaugh obviously got a massive deal to go to the LA Chargers. So he might be, you know, I don't know if he's better than Tress, but I mean, he got a deal that, you know, a really, really wealthy deal to go to the Chargers. So, you know, when you lose your head coach, who's a really good head coach, and you lose a first round quarterback, like, you don't have that eraser anymore. You know, again, we watch. You know, anyone that would listen last week, I said, you know, when people were saying, you think Chiefs 49ers, I'm like, well, you know, that's about as wide of a, a talent dis- disparage or a discrepancy as I've ever seen between Mahomes and Purdy. And Purdy's a nice kid. He played for Matt Campbell, who's I'm very tight with, Iowa State kid, but he was the last pick in the draft. Pat Mahomes is the second best quarterback who's ever lived at this point. And he's a guy that I don't think he's got a break rate, rate his ranks. I don't know if he'll play until he's 44 years old, but he is, a, he, you know, when they needed it, they ran, you know, the, the little uh, read option, um, follow game, like the little RPO between him and Kelsey, and he ran it. And again, he's, you know, that's the difference is when you have a great quarterback. Um, and again, Michigan, you can say what you want about JJ McCarthy. I don't think it was great, but he was better than the guy we had. He was better than Kyle McCord. And again, I don't think it was even close because, I mean, we'll see where Kyle gets drafted after this year, and we'll see where JJ, who's, I mean, they're the same age, and we took Kyle over JJ, which was a traumatic mistake by, by Ryan Day, which again, he gets a mulligan because we had C.J. Stroud and we've had really good quarterbacks and we're going to have a good quarterback this year. But I think when you lose that head coach, man, everything gets a little looser. And again, we only lost trust. Like, we didn't lose everybody. Michigan is losing everybody. You know, like, we didn't lose – we had Luke Fickle and then he hired Vrabel and we still had the whole offensive staff, the whole defensive staff. But, you know, the wheels fell off the wagon and it was a traumatically bad experience to lose seven games at Ohio State. And I think Michigan could do that because – not only have they lost their coach and their quarterback, they've lost their entire offensive line. All five guys have to be replaced. That is devastating. You know, they might be honestly, in terms of a talent pool of stat uh, of starts, they might be the youngest team in the country next year. And again, young teams get beat down when they play against good teams in college football, and their schedule is massively difficult. They got Texas coming there. They got to play um, SC. They got us at the end of the deal. Um, good luck, Sharon. Um, Nevada, any uh, any uh, rebuttals? I, I didn't think that this Michigan team, man, you know, I don't know what the over under is on the win total, but, I mean, you look at their schedule next year, man, it is, I mean, there's a reason why Jim Harbaugh got out of Dodge. You know what's coming. They got, you know, they got Fresno, obviously easy win. Then they play Texas in Ann Arbor. Texas will probably be a top three or four team. SC in Ann Arbor. They have to go to Washington, which obviously will be a little bit easier without uh, DeBoer there. They have to play Oregon. November 2nd, and then they got us. So, I mean, they got to play us, Oregon, you know, SC could be whatever, Texas. I mean, those are major, major games. Um, Your thoughts on their season next year in Nevada? Well, I just want to make one observation on something you said, which, again, great point, Uh, kind of of on topic, but kind of off topic. But you pointed out last night, who was the Kansas City Chiefs leading rusher of the Super Bowl? Patrick Mahomes. 66 (laughs) yards, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like... You know, we talk about the quarterback run. I know you guys get tired of hearing about it from us, but it's like, come on. If you can run Patrick Mahomes, who's arguably the second best quarterback of all time, maybe the first, maybe the third, whatever, one of the top quarterbacks of all time, if they can run Patrick Mahomes, come on, Ohio State. You can run the quarterback. It's going to be okay. But uh, but I, I I digress. The um, No, for Michigan, they're, gonna, they're falling on hard times right now. And I, I think when you've got a situation where you've got a, a new staff, designed with a young team, designed with a really tough schedule. It's just, you know, and we haven't even talked about the sanctions. We haven't even talked about the sanctions or anybody else leaving or the second portal window or anything else. Just assuming everything else is status quo, they're in a lot of trouble. They're in a lot of trouble. But, you know, the thing, when you talk to people inside the program, like Joey, like other people, they know it. They, they, they know it. It's, this is not a secret. This isn't sneaking up on them. However, what I, I would say is, the Michigan fan base might be one of the most delusional fan bases 
that I've ever seen. There, there, there was a thread on one of the Michigan message boards today, and the guy was talking about how he felt that the Michigan team that won the national championship could beat either one of the 49ers or the Chiefs because of the strength of their defensive line and their ability to run the ball or something like that. And I was like, that's got to be parody, right? Like, you can't be that dumb that you really believe that you could beat them. But no, that's uh, that's the state of where Michigan fans, Michigan fans really believe they can beat the Super Bowl champions. So I think next year is going to be just a, an amazing experience to watch them flounder. And it's, it's going to be glorious. And I can't wait. And, and, and let me be very clear. Anybody who ever says that a college team can beat an NFL team is just impossibly stupid. Like, I mean, I played on bad NFL teams and I still played with hall of their hall of famers on those teams. Like, you know, guys that were like really, really good players. Like I played on a bad San Francisco team that had, like Patrick Willis, Justin Smith, uh, Joe Staley, like guys, Frank Gore, you know, I mean, so when people say so, it just eliminates how dumb they are because Michigan got a, would have gotten housed by either of those teams, let alone any NFL team. But again, you know, it, you guys are smart. You guys pay attention to what we say. Don't be that guy. Like, don't be some say, oh, our, our team was so good because that's, that's Delulu, that's delusional, and that's where those guys are heading to. Um, got a ton of Super Chats uh, popping up. Real quick. I know you guys have been wearing me out about merchandise, about hats, t-shirts, hoodies. We're going to do a merchandise drop in the next two weeks or so. Uh, got a good partner. We're all jazzed up for it. It'll be really good looking stuff, high quality stuff. You guys will like it. Um, so I will let you know when that drops and I'll make sure that you guys have the link in our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so you guys want to wrap the scoop, you guys can wrap the scoop. So we'll have some, some really slick gear uh, and I'm really excited uh, for you guys to be repping it. Um, Sloth Nations, my boy, you're on here every night now. This is great. Um, so day one scoop member, uh, BuckeyeScoop.com, one of our best posters on our message board. Appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the five. Was able to make back-to-back -back live shows. How different do you think the offense will look from last year's? That's a great question. Um, I think it'll be much more explosive, even with Marvin leaving. I think that, you know, I think that Kyle was a little too locked in on Marvin, which is fine. He's the best receiver in the country. I get that. But... I think the foot speed of Will Howard will be dramatically different than what Kyle had. I mean, Kyle ran like he had two left feet and he was really slow. Just and, and again, I think that Chip Kelly with his philosophy of RPOs and moving the quarterback, moving the pocket, running the quarterback is going to be something that we haven't seen in Columbus uh, for a few years. And uh, again, I just want to take the free money, man. Because again, when the, when the Chiefs needed it in overtime of the Super Bowl, when it's fourth and one for the entire Super Bowl, they ran, they ran Pat Mahomes because you can't defend it. It's impossible. And when they needed it down in the red zone at the very end of the game, what did they do? Pat Mahomes scrambled. One, literally won the Super Bowl um, versus a good defense. And Pat Mahomes is worth like $500 million. So if he can run it uh, to go win the Super Bowl, then our guys can run it to beat Michigan and go win a national championship. So there's my spiel. I say it all the time. The reason why it's so hard to defend is because you're short a guy in the box every time you do it. It's single wing football. And again, that's why people did it. That's why the Miami Dolphins ran the Wildcat. That's why the uh, Arkansas Razorbacks versus LSU in 07 ran the Wildcat with McFadden and Felix Jones and Peyton Hillis because it's impossible to defend if you have good skilled guys because um, you're always a, you're always a man short. And again, that's what I like. I like unfair advantages. Um, and I think Chip Kelly is going to bring a lot of that to football. Chip Kelly is one of the most impressive clinic speakers I've ever listened to. He's a guy I told you at, at the four seasons in Dallas for that game. I talked to him for about an hour and just mind was blown because he is, he is a guy who footballs his life. It's he's all ball. He loves studying. He loves being progressive. He loves breaking trends. And again, that's my kind of guy. I want guys that they don't just settle into well, we'll do it this way because this is how everybody else does it and we don't want to be any different and we don't want to make any waves. I'm like, dude, like, let's go make a tidal wave today. Let's go do it. I mean, do you guys see what we do with Buckeye Scoop? Nobody's doing it like this. And again, it's all because of you guys. Again, you guys make this a huge show each and every night. And Nevada and I know that. So again, we appreciate you guys so much. But that's the difference is like we recognize what we're building here and you guys are a monstrous part of it. And we appreciate that. Nevada, how different will the offense look next year? Well, I think it'll just look easier. I, I just feel like watching it, I felt like we did offense the hardest possible way. We, you know, we were able to overwhelm teams.
because we were just much more talented than they were. Or we were more physically mm-hmm. gifted. I think we'll get way more walk-in scores or, wow, how did that guy get that open? Or look at that big play. And I, I, it'll be palpable. You'll, you'll be able to feel the difference because that's what Chip's great at. I mean, he is great at putting guys in a position where he's got numerical advantages. And that's why he runs the quarterback. He runs the quarterback just for you said – because you've got one more guy. You've got an additional blocker, and they can't account for him. And if, if, if you do it right, it's virtually impossible to defend. You said the biggest play of the year in the NFL, the Kansas City Chiefs ran an RPO with Pat Mahomes, where he attacked the line, faked the, the, read the, the uh, defensive end on the on that inside handoff, then attacked the line of scrimmage with Kelsey in front of him. So he had a pass run option there, and they picked it up easy because there's just not, you don't have enough guys to defend that. And so – uh, I expect to see more of that, and I expect to see Ohio State to put up absolutely video game numbers offensively, and, and anything short of that, I would I would be absolutely shocked. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and I'm over the moon excited about it. Um, Philip Bielaki, uh MD, thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the 10. Were you ever on an NFL playoff team? If so, who and when? Uh, thought Super Bowl was a great game. Uh, Philip, congratulations to your son, Winston, for graduating uh, basic training in the Army. He has a bright future. Thank you. Uh, thank him for being a patriot. Uh, you showed me a very, very nice email where you talked about how he went um, something like 17 weeks or 17. I think it was 17 weeks without a phone. And the first thing he asked was, where's how's Ohio State doing? He had no idea just because he was in the dark for a little bit. So um, congrats to you on that. He is going to be a pay it forward member. Um, cause going to be like taking care of our guys, especially guys that are diehard fans like he is. And I'm sure you've made him that way. So I appreciate you. Um, I was not, I was close. I was with the Miami dolphins. Uh, I was on the practice squad. We were trending towards the playoffs in 08. They ended up making it. And I got an offer to go to the active roster for the Bengals. And I did that. Um, which, you know, in, in hindsight, you, you know, you always don't look back, but that was probably a mistake. I should have stayed in Miami. Um, but it was fun. I never made it. Uh, I was always on like San Francisco, like bad teams. And it's funny because on bad teams, like the last month of the season, it's just like, let's just get out there, get it done and not get hurt, you know? And, and, uh, but like, they're great players, great times, but you know, most of the NFL ends the season sad because they don't make the playoffs. Or if you're like the 49ers last night, like, you know, there's no way you're happy after choking the game away like that. Um, I'd fire Kyle Shanahan after that performance, honestly. Um, the Super Bowl was a great game. But God bless, man. When you have Trent Williams, who's the best left tackle in the NFL right now, and you've got Christian McCaffrey, I just I don't understand how Kyle, Kyle Shanahan, he gets a little bit of Ryan Day in him sometimes where he thinks he's the smartest human being on earth, and he's like, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I should do to salt this game away, and I'm going to throw the ball. I'm going to put the ball in the hands of Brock Purdy to win the Super Bowl instead of Christian McCaffrey, who's, for my mind, my money, outside of Mahomes, McCaffrey is the best player in the NFL. He is so, so good. Um, and I just, I'd, I'd give him 50 carries last night and just let him do it and, and throw it to him, get him out on the edge. Don't just run him in the a gap, get him in space. Uh, cause you got guys that can block that stuff and their receivers are really good blockers. So I don't know, Cal, Cal Shanahan choked away that, that Atlanta, New England Super Bowl. That was the most majestic choke job I've ever seen in my life in the history of football. And then he did it again last night, which was crazy. Nevada, um, brief little synopsis on your thoughts on the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I know this was an Ohio State broadcast, but two things. One, look, I am all about aggression. Nobody likes to go for it more on fourth down than Nevada Buck. And I, I'm the original go for it on all four downs guy. So trust me, I get aggression. I understand it. I applaud it. But down three in the fourth quarter, fourth and three, and Shanahan went for it. Now, he got it, but I don't know what the heck he was doing in that situation. I mean, fourth and three? And instead of kicking a ship shot field goal, and now again, it worked out. But then in the overtime, I'm convinced they didn't understand the overtime rules because no right thinking person, given those overtime rules, is going to take the ball. You defer. You give the ball to the other team. If they score a touchdown, you come down, your goal is to score a touchdown, and you go for two. You don't give them the ball back. So it, it, that's what every that that's what the book says to do in that situation. And Shanahan took the ball. And I don't understand it. I'll never understand it. And I'm absolutely convinced. I know that by, by the exit interviews, you know the players didn't know the rule. I'm convinced Shanahan didn't understand the implications of the rule. He hadn't gamed that out. And I, I think that was a colossal mistake. He, I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he didn't know the rule. 
you know, that both teams get a possession as opposed to like the regular rules. Like if you score a touchdown, the game's over. But I don't think you need the rule that both teams get a possession. But, you know, it, it turned out to be a, a dramatic mistake. And, you know, again, that that's a really talented team. I feel bad for the players that they weren't smart enough. But like Andy Reid knew the rule because Chris Jones went to bat for him and said, we knew it. We heard all about it. We knew how we we're going to attack overtime. And that's critical, man. I mean, that's a huge, huge, huge difference. If someone says both teams get possession of the ball as opposed to a touchdown wins the game. Paul Lewis, what is up, brother? Uh, I might change your name to JJ Lewis since I got JJ's middle name. My boy, Jeremiah Javon Smith, who's going to be a monstrous player this year. I can't wait to see him out on the field. Um, thank you for the 50, brother. Appreciate you. Guys, this is your chip offered Ryan. Chip offered Ryan the OC job at Oregon. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, is a true chip offered uh, Ryan the OC job at Oregon back in the day? Maybe I, I'm not. I'm not sure um, what this is. Nevada, help me on this one. Is a true chip I, offered? I mean, that would have been like, that would have been like 2011, and I, I'm not sure that you know because that's when Chip yeah. left Oregon. So yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I that wouldn't make given the timeline and stuff. I don't think it makes it. But while we're talking about offers and things like that. Wanted I mentioned it before, but Chip Kelly was offered the OC job before Bill O'Brien accepted it. He turned it mm -hmm. down, met with UCLA subsequently, got that got whacked, or you know, was told live with within your means there, Chip. And then Bill O'Brien goes gift. Chip Kelly doesn't. That's why it took him an hour to say yes the next time around. That's first thing. Second thing, little known factoid. You know the uh, the AD who you're not a fan of, Martin Jarman, who's getting killed by the UCLA fans for hiring Deshaun Foster, great yeah. running back, and no experience as UCLA head coach today. He was the guy that Gene Smith was openly advocating to be the next athletic director at Ohio State. And uh, I mean, he was uh, Gene Smith was lobbying people for this to happen. What, I mean, we dodged a bullet big time. Martin Jarman, as you, you know him personally, you served on a board with him, you know how unimpressed he is. He just hired Deshaun Foster to be their head coach. And if you guys, you know, like I said, I'm a UCLA guy, love Deshaun, remember Deshaun Buster, you know, very much when he played at UCLA, he's got no experience head coach at all. And there's nothing in his background that indicates he's going to be able to handle the job. And he just got a, his first job, head coach, UCLA football. I think it's insane. I don't understand it at all. And that would have been our AD. And that's, that's frightening to me. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I have nothing against Martin, but he's an empty suit. Like I, like I literally sat next to him for years on a board and like when he started, like when he went to like Boston college, I was like, did they interview anybody else? Was he the only guy they interviewed? And then the, he goes to UCL and I'm like, again, is what it is. But I mean, he's just, he's not a real sharp guy. So you know, I've, I've been around guys that are like wicked smart and guys that I'd be like, yeah, that's the guy that I want to lead my program. And then I've been around guys like him. And if I'm Chip Kelly, man, I'm getting out of there. Cause that thing is about to hit the side of the mountain again. Maybe I'm wrong. And here's the thing. You guys record this, screen grab this. And if Deshaun um, Foster is a raging success at UCLA, make sure you play this back. Say, Kirk, you were wrong. You're dumb. You don't know what you're talking about. But like to hire a running backs coach to be your first time head coach at a place like UCLA where you could get a star to come there. Because that's a, that's a, it's not a great job, but it's a great location. Families like living there because you're right in the most beautiful part of the country, basically. Um, and you know, it, it's, 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 it's a brand, you know, but like to get to settle with a, a running back search is who's, who's never even been a coordinator. And again, that's like people talk about pet peeves, like hiring a position coach to be a head coach, unless he's just some superstar is almost always just, it, it just an egregiously poor decision. Cause you've never even ran one side of the ball. I mean, Deshaun, he coaches one guy on the entire field. Like, when you coach running backs, like, that's one of the easiest. Like, running backs and tight ends are, like, the entry-level spots, especially tight ends. But, you know, I mean, that's – but, again, that's my opinion. And I get that he's a, he's an alumni, and that's, like, in vogue right now. But, God bless, man. That's the best you can do when you're up against it. You're about to join the Big Ten. Good for us. You're going to get steamrolled by the Bucks. Sean Rollins, thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the 10. Two American flags. I love that. Um Fun fact, our shirts are going to have uh, a little bit of that on them, and I'm going to wait to reveal them to you guys, but I think you guys are going to really like it. So hopefully um, when that link drops, I'll let you guys know uh, if you guys want to get some Buckeye Scoop gear. And 
uh, with our partners, Buffalo Wild Wings, we are going to start doing uh, some meetups. Because I know you guys have been like, we could have a get together, you know, have some wings, uh, have some iced tea, whatever. Um, so we're going to do that. It'll be a blast. And I think, I know you guys will really enjoy it. Ohio State 614. Thank you for the five from Ohio State 614, Ohio, Nevada. Watch every day. Learned a lot about football watching you guys, even helping my son playing quarterback at Western World South. Thanks. Well, I mean, that's a great compliment. And again, uh, I hope your son has uh, wild success in, in high school. High school football, um, it teaches you a lot about how to be a man, how to be, you know, how to learn, how to be tough. You know, there's a lot of times where, you know, like the hardest moments of your life, you're like, God, is this as hard as when I was running 20 half gassers and high school conditioning or whatever? And it just helps you make you mentally tough as you get into college and then the real world and you're working and whatever. Um, I think football gives you a lot of that. So uh, congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Um, obviously, you've had sons be high school athletes, uh, a lot of different sports and uh, you have daughters as well. Um, your thoughts on, uh, you know, learning he's learning some quarterback play for you that's amazing yeah that's that's so great it's just like, like i said i i admire any of these kids that go out there and and play and do it at, at any level because it's hard man it's hard it's, it's like easy you know I, what i found with sports is it's easier as you get older because you just remember stuff easier you're like oh wow that that should have been easy i would have done that and did that but man i i remember when i was playing it wasn't easy and uh i you know I, i'd go out there and you see some of the kids from Colton, and they'd be six foot four, three hundred pounds back then, three hundred pound kids. You, we'd never seen a three hundred pound kid before, and I was scared to death. I mean, I was literally like scared to death that I was going to die out there in the field. So, the combination of fear and uncertainty is is a terrible thing. So, anybody that goes out there and does it, plays in front of these crowds, man, I, I tip my hat to them at any, at any level. So, uh, God bless them all for trying. Yeah, I I agree, and I think that high school athletics are something that. You know, it's just it's great for kids to be active. Um, my kid actually had hockey practice tonight before this, so uh, he's out there buzzing around skating. Um, it's always fun to watch him get a little bit of work in. Uh, Ohio Bucks 08, thank you for the five, my friend. No matter how they frame it, roster and staff attrition or not, Sharon was born on third. He's been handed a top five historical program at 37, born on third. Nevada, I think you're definitely going to agree with this one, but uh, your thoughts on Sharon Moore being born on third base? Well, I think Oracle said it back best. He's like, he's born on third. He's going to go try to steal second or something like that. Because yeah. uh, I, I, I just think that's a that's a backward thing that, you know, there there's no path to home plate for Sharon Moore. And so he's being set up to fail. You always have to have a guy. Now he's going to be paid handsomely to do it. Um, yeah. But but somebody had to step into that job. Somebody's going to have to take the wax. And then they're going to make him do no more. They're going to cry and it wasn't Sharon's fault and don't punish Sharon. He didn't do it. It was evil Harbaugh. You watch. This is the way this thing's going to go down. I thought in Sharon's, oh, I didn't know it. He'll start sobbing again and stuff like that. But uh, no, I, I, he's, he has no path forward that's going to end with him being successful at Michigan. He's he's gone. With, uh, I, I say within three years, could be for it, but he's definitely gone. I, I say gone within three years. Because I think it's going to be bad, and, and um, I think they're going to get tired of him as a fall guy. They're going to need to bring in the next fall guy quickly after that. Well, like with Sharon, you know, I I think it's like he was born on third in a stadium that's about to be like imploded. Like they've got the dynamite, they've got like the plunger thing, like in like in Looney Tunes, like Wile E. Coyote or whatever. That's where he's at. Like he's on third base, but man, the whole stadium's about to. It's going to be like. Um, like Bane in the Batman movie where like the stadium seal like, like it like collapses and there's a big hole that goes in the ground because he detonates it. That's what it's going to look like uh, in the next couple of months. And, you know, again, I get somebody had to get the job, you know, I mean, somebody had to stay behind, but I mean, you know, the, the best thing ever is their big Bo Shebeckler thing that they put everywhere is those that say will be champions. I'm like, well, nobody stayed except for Sharon. And then, you know, maybe like one other coach, but Jim Harbaugh fleeced that place and took everybody. And again, that's, you know, I mean, I mean even Rick Minter left yesterday. Rick Minter was like, you know, that was Jesse Minter's dad who coached at Cincinnati. He was a head coach there for a long time. He left to go be an analyst. So, I mean, they didn't leave anybody behind. So, you know, I, I think that Sharon is going to have a rude awakening. And again, I've said it before and I've said it again. I think Jim Harbaugh is a really good coach. And again, you can say, Kirk, you're an idiot, but he's won the national championship on undefeated and he got a huge deal to go coach the LA Chargers. He was good in San Francisco, took a team to the Super Bowl. Um, 
and you know when he leaves places they decay like the 49ers like after Jim Harbaugh left decayed and they stunk for a long time until they got um Kyle Shanahan and when Stanford you know they were okay for a little bit when they still had the remnants of Harbaugh when Shaw took over but look where they're at now they stink um and then Michigan it's going to be the same thing man when, when he takes off they'll hold it together a little bit but when you lose like you know, your, your left and right hand is like your head coach is your left hand and your strength coach is your right hand. So when you lose both those guys, nasty, ugly, bad. And I mean, those guys are the tone setters for the whole program. And then they take, you know, the DC, they take all your, all the whole staff, basically like it's the culture has gone. And again, it's going to be really fun for us to watch. Cause I think they're going to hold on, hold on before, before you get to your next question. Like when Bain had everybody there in New York and they had like the nuclear weapon and stuff like that. And he had like his henchmen that were working with him. Why would the henchmen say, "What type of job like are you going to stay at with the guy? You're going to get nuked. You're going to get blown up by a nuclear weapon or something like that." How did he get people to work for him? I don't even understand. Who, it didn't make any sense. Yeah, he had all those people that, that were working for him, and he's like, "Hey, we're going to blow up the entire city." And like they're like, "Okay, I'm I'm down with that. I'll stay here for that." That made no sense. But what about I like the. The, the guy that like they left on the plane when the plane was going down at the very beginning it was like the greatest opening scene in any movie ever was like the plane's going down and and he says we're gonna they're after they're gonna expect one of us to be in the wreckage my brother and the guy's like okay it'll be me so like bane like para drops out and then the other dude just goes down in the plane even though he has a shoot so again i that is that is a phenomenal phenomenal movie um We'll get into the next one. Chad Pollard, thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my friend. Kirk, please inform me, regular fan, how the OSU football org chart works. Who reports to who? Coordinators to head coach, also GASQC analysts. This is a fantastic question, so I appreciate you, Chad. Um, basically, you know, it, it's like a regular org chart. At the very top of the org chart, um, I, I would say, is like Ryan Day, Um let me see if I can get this fired up. Okay, give me one second. Let's make an org chart. Let's do it. All right, so got my handy dandy thing. So up here is Arn, is Ryan Day. So he's the head coach. So he's at the very top of the food chain here. So then here you got, you know, you got, you got Jim Knowles and you got Chip Kelly. And then um, I think that there's layers, you know, if there's, Guys that are assigned coordinator titles. And again, I don't know what the final coordinator titles are going to be, but on offense, you basically have like a real, you know, he's the OC. And then you've got like the two, you've got like the two baby OCs, which is Brian Hartline. Um, and you've got Justin Fry. And then, you know, uh, under like both of these, you basically have the rest of the guys, Keenan Bailey, Tony Alford. Um, and that's it. So, and then over here, and then under under these guys are like the GAs and the and the QCs. So I think that those are on there. Um, and then over here with Jim Knowles, you've got um, basically I, I would say Tim Walton is in a in a league of his own. I'll put that right over here because it's kind of get covered up. So there. Um, and then you've got kind of the rest of the guys funnel down. So you got you got LJ, you've got um, you know you don't have a linebackers coach. You got Matt. You have Matt Gariani. Um, so that's kind of it. So, I mean, you got Ryan Day. Then to the left, you got Jim uh, Jim Knowles. And uh, I'll put DC here so it's easier. It's just easier for me to just write this out freehand. But I, I would say it's something like this. Now, it could be a little bit different. I'll get your little note off the screen. Um, and then the QCs and the analysts are just at the bottom of the totem pole. But, um, you know, I don't know if these guys are going to stay as co-OCs. But that's kind of what they are. That's what they were last year. Um you know, even though they weren't real OCs. So I know this is a very sloppy, uh, ham-handed thing that I'm doing right here, but I'm just trying to give you guys kind of what it looks like for the org chart. This is like a two second, let me whip this thing up real quick and show you what it looks like. So something like that. I mean, obviously Ryan's at the top. The two coordinators report to Ryan. Um, again, like on offense, when you've got Justin Fry, who was like the running game coordinator slash OC, and then Brian Hartland was like the, the full OC. Those guys both report to Chip. Um, and then under them is Keenan Bailey and Tony Alford. Um, and again, this could get reorganized if they restructure. Because I think it's it's silly having three offensive coordinators. Like, it's almost dumb. So I don't know if they take that away from Fry or if they take it away from Heartland or how they do that. And then, you know, Tim Walton got a nice bump last year where he was kind of the head of the whole secondary because 
Clearly, he was outperforming Perry Eliano. Ryan recognized that. And he thought it'd be better to have one voice kind of drive uh, that what was being taught in the back end, which is the secondary. So he promoted Tim Walton. So Tim is kind of ahead of everybody on their org chart. And then under that is, is, is Larry Johnson and Matt Giuliani. And, you know, we don't carry, we don't carry a, you know, so I don't know where the 10th guy's going to go, but if it's a linebacker coach, then you could put James here or whoever, whoever this last guy is, who's a defensive guy in all likelihood. Um, he'll be right next to, to Matt Giuliani and, and Larry Johnson. Nevada, uh, your thoughts. I mean, I think that's about as simple as like, and then like the analysts are at the very bottom. So they're like underneath, they're underneath the totem pole. So that's where the analysts and GAs live. Thoughts, Nevada? Yeah, the only thing I'd say is you know, like, like a guy like Joe Philbin will have like a dotted line to uh, to Ryan Day. So may, even though he's at the bottom of the thing, he may have a direct, you know, it, w- it wouldn't be the same thing as, as uh, an you know, intern, for, you know, B yeah. Fox the intern or something like yeah. that. So mm-hmm. B Fox the the legend. I'm gonna call out B Fox the legendary intern. But uh no, you know, sometimes you know guys will have you know more contact or not based upon their relationship, their stature with the head coach. But uh um yeah, that was a pretty good job of the uh thing. I can tell you got your MBA and I'd say that you got like a like a B plus in that class right there. In, in art class, I wasn't real good at in drawing <laughs> little, little, little squiggly lines. Um, Pooh Beard 12, thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Appreciate you, my friend. Scoop Ultra is all good to pay it forward. Pay it forward has been absolutely fantastic, so we appreciate you guys. Uh, does Chip Kelly's up tempo offense, i.e., more shorter possessions, change Knowles's approach on D? Uh, what does synergy between O and D look like from a philosophical standpoint? OH, Nevada. I, oh. I did it. I did it. I pointed the right way. So it's literally the reverse because the, the mirror in the camera reverses everything I do. So apologize for pointing like this, like an idiot. It's like I'm pointing out my door. Um, I, I'll let you take that first, Nevada, because I kind of had to draw for a second. But uh, your thoughts on the synergy between the O&D with Chip Kelly and Jim Knowles? Well, I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, you know, Ryan Day's of kind of a, of the opinion that you know, he wants to put as many points on the board as possible. And with, with Jim Knowles, the thought was that Jim Knowles would come in, play kind of a high risk type of defense that, you know, if it surrendered big plays, that was OK because it got the ball back. But I think what they found last year is they could kind of suffocate teams without, you know, the, without risking, you know, bringing on blitzes, without trying to go overboard in terms of creating turnovers. And, you know, they were unbelievable on third down. They won third down in a big way. Um, you know, they they, they held other teams you know, yards per play yards per possession points per possession you know way way down low and that was kind of a successful formula now chips coming in chip wants to go fast chip wants to go fast but i, I think that what they're going to do this year is they're just going to put pedal to the metal they're not they're not really worried about hey you know we're worried about you know playing a tempo game or keeping our defense off the field or they're just going to go look we're just we think we're better than everybody and we're going to try to outscore you and then when you get the ball we're just going to try to suffocate you and and that's different you know that you know they haven't felt like this where they felt like they had you know both units kind of cooking at a high level but they feel like they have it this year and i think that's that's reflected in the style that they're going to play um so you know while trestle was the ultimate master of melding offense defense and special teams you know trying to play a slow plotting game on offense run the ball grind the clock out, play good defense, and every position in a kick, either a punt, a kickoff, or a field goal, or an extra point. And, um, you know, he was he was a master in terms of doing that. And that's why we had so many great defenses when Trestle was here, because the style of offense we played. I don't think that's going to be the case this year. I think we're going to have a great defense because we have a great defense. But I don't think they're going to be trying to, you know, they're not going to try to shorten the games. They're going to be trying to get as many offensive plays as possible because of this great offensive talent that we have. So it's it's going to be different and fun to watch. Yeah, I agree. I think there's going to be a time to go fast and see how fast we can wear defense out. And I like it. I mean, I think it's, it's a lot. It's very stressful to go against a high tempo offense. And, you know, I remember I was sitting with you at the Oregon game in 14, man, and we watched that first Oregon drive. And I was like, they might score 80 points on us because yeah, they looked really good. And they went right down the field. And that was hell frick. But, you know, Chip Kelly recruited all the, he recruited Mariota. He coached him his first year. Chip's last, I believe his last year might have been 12. I think his last year of coaching was 12. 
Um, and then Chip took over, uh, or Halford took over 13, 14. We saw him in 14. Uh, but he had Mariota, like his redshirt freshman year, and he was really good. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let me see. Jeffrey Levin, thanks uh, for, or Levine, thank you for the deuce. If you have a question, toss that in the chat. Uh, Russ Stollard, thank you for the five. I've been watching some Chip Kelly offense. I know he loves to run the ball. Anywhere our receivers don't get enough touches. I don't think so. I just don't think he's had receivers like what we have. I mean, you look at the guys he had in Oregon, like, I don't I don't know if he ever had guys that were like in Mecca and Jeremy. He's never had a guy like Jeremiah Smith in college. There's no chance. So I think that he's about feeding the offense. Again, like Oregon, you're not going to get number one overall receivers to go to Oregon, especially back when he was there. He was like DeAnthony Thomas and uh, scat back little fast guys as opposed to what – he gets at Ohio State. So I think he's just all about feeding whoever the best players are. And that's something he's really good at and he's real creative about. And I'm excited to see it because I love creativity on offense and figuring out ways to manufacture touches for your best players. Because I think Kyle Shanahan does a good job of that, but he just he loses his mind in big games. Like it's insane how bad he is in big games. But he's really creative with how he gets balls to McCaffrey and Debo and Ayuk. And that's something that I think Chip's really good about. I mean, he's really good at getting guys in space and getting really fast guys, the balls in, uh, in, in open territory where they can make moves and be, uh, kind of a pain in the butt to go against Nevada. Are you, uh, worried about our receivers not getting enough touches? No, I mean, Chip understand. I mean, he's all about creating mismatches. And as you pointed out, you know, he never got the Marmadukes at Oregon at a wide receiver and he still got the ball to those guys. And some of those guys put up some pretty good stats you know, he was usually getting, the, like you said, the small kids out of Southern California that were, you know, escaping, you know, gang violence at Long Beach Poly or something like that. But, um, no, he, he, he knows how to feed the guys. He understands, you know, what he has from a talent perspective. Um, look, any offensive coordinator is going to have a trouble keeping everybody happy on this offense because there's just so much talent on the offense. But in a, uh, in a season where you're, you're it's going to require depth, it's a, a tough schedule. Um, the back end is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen before. You got to get everybody. You're going to need it. It's going to be all hands on deck to win. And I think Chip understands that. Yeah, I absolutely uh, and totally agree. Um, okay, Chad, I appreciate you. I got another one. I uh, got the five. P.S. Long time viewer, uh, first time super chat. Wife Aaron. Hi Aaron. I hope you guys enjoy the show together. Uh, and I watch daily. And wanted to know if you have any other Kelly scoops hoodie. Well. Anyone that knows me, especially my poor wife, knows that all I wear is black. I'm like Marilyn Manson, Travis Barker, The Undertaker, Johnny Cash. Like Those are like my fashion tastes. But I do have this one. I wear this one around a little bit. Um, this one's kind of slick. It's uh, it's like a gray. It's got the red on it. Um, and then I, you know, I again, I, I wear the logo every day. This is our brand. We made this brand. And so I rock the brand. And then I put on the back of the hood, I put... So this is the hood. So when you pull the hood up, you've got Buckeye Scoop on your head. But I usually have the hood back, so it's got a big Buckeye Scoop logo on it. So when I wear it around, like if I'm sitting somewhere, you see the big Buckeye Scoop behind my head. So I represent it. But in general, all of my stuff is black. I love black. It's all I wear. Um, so yeah, but we're going to do, we're going to start off simple with our first uh, clothing drop. We're going to do a hat, a hoodie, and a shirt. And that's it. And if it goes great, again, this is a trial run. With a company I'm really excited to try out. Uh, if it goes great, then we'll open it up a little bit more and we'll take some uh, some suggestions. But it'll be real simple. It'll be very good quality stuff. And I think you guys are really going to like it because uh, it's going to be really short. Because, again, um, I want my stuff to look stylish. And I am not going to accept anything other than that. So uh, I think you guys will really like it. Uh, but uh, thank you for that super chat. And I'm glad. Again, I love hearing who you guys watch with because I see... Father, daughter, I see husband, wife, um, I see kids, you know, we're a very family friendly show. So we appreciate that. Um, and it's always just kind of cool seeing the dynamics of people that like to watch the show together. So appreciate all of that. And again, we keep, uh, we keep all that in mind when we're uh, creating content for you guys. Uh, Luis Torres, thank you for the five. Joey's dad coached my son on the FBU 11U team this past winter. Great to have him in Scarlet Gray, best butt guy podcast, hands down. Joey's dad is a great dude. I talked to him multiple times at the Bowdome in Hilliard. Um, my best friend's kid is a kid named Ryan Miller, who is a first baseman for Ohio State, transferred up from the Tennessee Volunteers. Um, so they would be in the cages hitting together. 
Joey was a few years older than Ryan. Um, so he was, I think Ryan was like a freshman or a sophomore when Joey was a senior. And, you know, those guys could both rake. So sitting next to them in the cages when they're hitting, uh, there's a lot of dings because they're hitting the crap out of the ball. But really, really good guy. Excited that uh, his son has the opportunity to come to Columbus. And again, I always tell kids, I always used to say to this kids in recruiting, look, if you have an offer from Ohio State and an offer from Michigan, they're both, they're both, again, this is, you're going to hate me for saying this. They're both great educations, great schools, great, great programs. But if you live, if you want to live in Ohio when you're done, go to Ohio State. If you want to live in Michigan, if you want to live in Detroit or Ann Arbor or Birmingham or wherever, uh, go to Michigan. Because again, like your Michigan degree down here is going to be worth anywhere near as much as Ohio State's degree is, just in terms of the network and saying, hey, I played football at Ohio State. People get real excited, people are happy. If you say you play football at Michigan, there's kind of sneers and jeers and I've seen it, you know, and, and, I, and I tell guys that and guys that don't listen to me are idiots, you know, because that's what it is. So Ohio State, like playing football at Ohio State has given me everything in my life. So I'm eternally grateful for everything Ohio State's done for me. The people I've met, people like Nevada Buck, uh, a lot of you guys, you know, that I've met in person, a lot of people that are on Buckeye Scoop, uh, business contacts for my, you know, what everything else I've done, like it's all because of Ohio State. So um, there's my commercial for that. Nevada, um, how great is it to see a kid transfer from Michigan to Ohio State? I love that. Well, well it's it's great. And, you know, your point about Ohio State, look, if, if you don't use the Ohio State affiliation to your benefit from either a business side, personal side, whatever, then you're really blowing it. You're talking about the largest alumni network in the world and the most passionate fans, intelligent fans, um, guys that understand the tradition. And it's just, you know, it, look, for a young person, dude, use it. I mean, use it. It's 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 there to be used. And, and Ohio State fans are just the most gracious and generous people in the world. So, for, you know, if you're playing sports, it's really kind of a no-brainer. But it, that really goes for anything, whether you're in sports or business or nursing or or whatever it is. It's just, you know, it's great to be a Buckeye. And it's, it's really great to be a Buckeye in Ohio. Um, can't imagine anything better than that. Totally agree. Again, it's... um. It's something that it's given me a lot in life and you, you know, use it in a very subdued way. Like you don't have to wear your rings every day and you don't have to wear your gold pants every day. Cause you know, you just want to, you know, like, yeah, I played and you can look me up if you want, but I don't like, I don't wear any jewelry. Like I don't. So it's like some guys wear their rings every day. And I was like, you know, that probably means that you didn't play a lot. If you were, if you have to tell people who you are, um, I mean, that's probably just me being me, me being me, but I just, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't need to like wear my, my six rings and my six gold pants. And those are in a box somewhere, I think in my closet, but uh, I digress. I do wear Buckeye Scoop stuff every day though. Uh, Geo did it 42, thank you for the 10. Kyle Shanahan will forever be known as the choke artist. Thank you, brother. Thank God, I'm not the only one screaming that. I was screaming at my TV to run the ball against a team in KC, which I hadn't stopped the run all season. Again, smartest guy in the room. And again, that, that is a, a fantastic take. And you know, because again, you've got Christian McCaffrey, who in a lot of years would be the MVP of the league. I mean, if you take him off that team, I don't know if they, I mean, they probably are eight and eight, but he's so good and he's so dominant. He's got so much endurance. He can take 25, 30 carries. Uh, he's great in space. He's so smart. Um, it's crazy how good he is. And again, they just kind of said, let's throw the ball. Because again, if I have Brock Purdy as my quarterback, I am not putting the ball on his, I'm not putting the game, excuse me, on his shoulders. There's no way. Um, Nevada, uh, we won't talk too much about the Super Bowl, but do you agree that I mean, that was a massive choke, man? Because if you run that ball with, I mean, and you have Trent Williams as your left tackle, like he hammers the left side of the line every time he comes off the ball. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I had a bet on, on the 49ers under 24 and a half team points. So a touchdown in overtime would have, I mean, the fact that it went overtime kind of messed me up anyway. And uh, if they scored a touchdown in overtime, it was their, their team total was going to go over. So I applauded his uh, his chokiness <laughs> there. And uh, so, no, but I didn't understand it. I, I don't understand how you can't run McCaffrey because it didn't seem like the Chiefs could stop it. And no. um, it's I felt like kind of like Lane Kiffin in the uh, yes, in the fifth, exactly the fifth, in the, the Bama game. Oh my god! Where, where, where like I don't think we were really doing a very good job of stopping their run and. And for some reason, they just stopped running the ball. And I, I thank goodness every day that that happened. Like, and again, like some of these guys, like, I don't know if they go to too many Glazier clinics or they, they read too many books about analytics of football, but like, you know, 
Alabama and 14 had us on the ropes and they were hammering us. And it's like, they decided to like walk back and like go do the Cupid shuffle for five minutes. And all of a sudden, like we recovered and hammered them. But like they were handing the ball to Derrick Henry, who is terrifying in the backfield. And he was gashing us. And also they say, we're not going to give it to him. We're going to let Blake Sims, their quarterback, who's probably the worst quarterback that started in the saving era, start throwing the ball. And I, I just, for the life of me, I don't, there's, and I think Lane Kiffin is a fantastic offensive mind, but these guys, some of these guys, I'm telling you, it's like, it's like they smell their own farts or something. And they're like, Oh, that this, we're going to do this because everyone's going to expect us to run Derrick Henry. He's 240 pounds. was a four two forty, And instead we're just going to, you know, what we're going to do, we're just going to let Blake Sims throw it all over the place. So again, like not all, there are no gurus, but these guys just drive me crazy sometimes. That don't care. Ross Bach, thank you for being an ultra member. Uh, one of our couples, uh, one of our married couples that watches. Thank you so much. Uh, hello to our scoop family. Appreciate you, brother. I foresee the cheaters up north being a bottom tier team for the next 10 years or more. Do you agree? Oh, I think, I think it's going to be bad. I think sanctions are going to be bad. I think that the thing is they, they're going to have to ace. They're going to have to go after a big dog for their next coach hire. When all the sanctions erode and Sharon Moore is, you know, is, is left for dead. They're going to have to go get a big guy, like a big time guy. Um, Cause Sharon Moore is not a big time head coach. Obviously he's never been a head coach and he, he has a very limited tree of people to pick from. I think Wink Martindale is going to be a disaster as a DC, just because he doesn't want to be in college. He doesn't want to deal with college. He doesn't, you know, he'll, he'll yell at guys during spring ball and they'll transfer out. Um, I don't know. I, I just think that a lot of puzzling hires and again, Jim Harbaugh is doing his protege, no favors by taking every single coach, you know, I mean, he could have said, Hey guys, you know, Hey Michigan, Hey ward manual, give a couple of these guys raises and let them stay. Like you make one of those D line coach or back end guys, make one of those guys, the DC instead of bringing in wink Martindale. And I think wink Martindale is a fine coach, but dude, like he doesn't want to be in college. He's been in the NFL his whole career. You know, and then you're going to hire him to be the Michigan guy. He'll be there for one year and he'll say, I don't want to deal with this NIL stuff anymore. These kids leaving after I say mean stuff to him during spring bowl. So I think it's going to be ugly. And again, you know, when you see guys whiffing on some of these hires, because they've got a very, very talent, uh, they have a very talentless coaching staff. When I look at some of the guys' resumes, scary. Um, Nevada, well, Michigan be a bottom tier Big Ten team for the next 10 years. Well, look, I mean, they kind of defied the odds the last few years by one, being one of the few teams that really, the, old, the, the team ever that I can ever remember that just hadn't recruited well, had recruited kind of bottom tier talent and was able to win games and win a national championship. Uh, and just yesterday, they're, they're, I think their best recruit from the 2024 class asked out of his national letter of intent, the linebacker. So, like, I mean, think about that. Like their best recruit, just asked out of his national letter of intent. And, you know, how can they not become irrelevant? I mean, this isn't Ohio State homerism or this. Is a, they've lost their entire staff. They have no recruiting base. And their best recruit just asked out of his NLI. I, 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 don't, see, I don't see any other outcome other than bottom tier in the Big Ten. I, I don't think there's any other path forward for them. Well, and imagine, you know, you're you're a Michigan man. You're a Michigan recruit. You sign your letter in December. Harbaugh, you know, wins the national championship. And then everybody leaves. Like, if I'm signing there, I'm like, so I don't know. Like, I don't know really anyone that's going to be there. There's a couple of guys that were retained and promoted. You know, the line coach was the tight ends coach. Or was the, he was something last year. I don't know what he was. I mean, Jay Harbaugh was the tight ends coach. I, I just don't. I, I don't understand what you're trying to do um, if you're a player there. Because, I mean, everyone that recruited you has gone. Again, it'd be like if you committed to Washington last year. And like, oh, wow, Washington were really good. And we played the national championship. And then, you know, Kalen DeBoer gets the Bama job and everybody's gone. And now you got Jed Fish there. And you're like, God, I didn't sign up to play for this guy. You know, so, again, that's, you know, after the spring. And I think that some of the guys like Colson Loveland or diehard Michigan guys are going to give it through spring see how it goes, maybe try these guys out. But man, if, if I, again, if I got to replace all five starters on the offensive line and I got to replace my quarterback and I got to place Blake Corum and my two receivers and a bunch of my defense, like I, I don't think I've ever seen an entire offensive line leave before. Like at least not at Ohio State. Again, I'm sure it's happened in the history of college football, but I've never seen five guys dip at once because that, 
That is very, very, very tough. Um, chocolate chip cookie. Uh, thanks for the five, brother. Appreciate you all. Love Kirk and Nevada. You are amazing. Uh, and the very best at doing what we uh, love. And that's OSU football. Spam the like button, y'all. Nevada OH. I O. You the man. Appreciate you, my man. Your name is hilarious to me every single time. I am not going to say that. We are a family broadcast. So hopefully uh, it is what it is. Pooh Beard 12, thanks for being an ultra member. Uh, and thanks for being awesome on BuckeyeScoop.com. You're a newer member and you're killing the game. So I appreciate all of your contributions. I keep hearing from the OSU beat about rumors that Lawrence might want to go on the road, wants to keep the GA role. Any truth to this or is it an error of being pushed from inside the whack? Wow, Nevada, get your... Uh, Load up your clips, load up your shotguns, load up your missile launchers, get in your tank, and uh, get ready to drive over this one. Um, Nevada, is that a narrative being pushed from inside the Woody Hayes that 37-year-old James Lornitis uh, would like to not go on the road and still be a GA next year? Well, yeah. Now, in fairness, Oracle, on our boat, who, who is one of the great insiders that I've ever been around in terms of said something kind of similar. It was, it, was, it was more of a question, but he did put that out there. So I want to defend our boy, the Oracle, because he did say something up around these lines. But yes, this is a narrative that's being pushed out from Ohio State out there into the land. And the reason they're doing this is because there's a very good chance that James does not get hired for that job. And they know how, how popular James is with the OSU fan base. So they've got to put it out there and they've got to push it out there that James doesn't really want this job. He really, he really isn't sure if he wants to be a full-time coach yet. He's uncertain. So in case they go the other way and they go with another coach, that this is kind of out there in the ether. And they've, they've done a very successful job. At, and this is what they do all the time. So when we talk about narratives, you know, this isn't like some conspiracy. We've lived this. I've lived this for 25 years with Ohio State. I believe this was long before Mark Pantone ever got there, but Pantone's really good at this. And so when they want to put something out there, they know where to go. They know where to spread it. They know what to say. And so that's kind of been out there. But no, James wants very much to be a full-time coach. And, and he has let that be known. Will he be successful in terms of getting it? I think right now, I think it's a jump ball. We're not, we're not sure. I don't, I guarantee he doesn't even know. So you know, we're all kind of on pins and needles waiting to see who's going to be named the 10th head coach. But um, no, James very much wants to be that guy, wants to accept the challenge. Um, he's, he's He realizes that a 36-year-old guy who's got the head coaching job in Seattle, um, he's not he's not waiting around. So he, he, he wants it. He wants it badly. And, and again, like, that's why I'm glad you guys watch our show, because we're the only ones that they can't, like, come to and, and say, hey, we guys push this narrative because we're not going to do that. Like they can't control us. They can't do. I mean, and again, we love Ohio State. We're big Ryan Day fans. Go watch the coverage of the Cotton Bowl from us versus everybody else. We're very, very positive towards Ryan when people were basically beating him to death and pinning him to the cross. We were like, you know, helping him and saying, "Hey, I believe in this guy. I think he's good." But there are times where you'll see all of the the little uh, Geppettos get told to say something, and they all say it in unison. James doesn't want to go on the road. James doesn't want to work. James doesn't want to be a full-time coach. I'm like, dude, like he was on the road for an entire month working like crazy, crisscrossing the country, sitting middle seats on American airlines. You know, he's, you know, you're not living on, you're not on the private jet. Like Ryan day is you're on like a middle seat flying from Miami to Los Angeles overnight to go recruit and then flying to, it's like, it is a massive grind and he killed it. And again, the players love him. The coaches love him. So, again, I don't know what the holdup is, but, again, you know, James is 37 years old. He's not a spring chicken. And when I was a GA, I was 27, and so I was 10 years younger. And I and I fully admit, when you're 27 and a GA, you feel like a total scrub because most of the GAs are 23, 24, former players uh, that didn't make it to the NFL. You know, James, James gets penalized because he played in the NFL for 10 years. So he didn't get into coaching until – and then he broadcasted for a couple of years – so he didn't really get into this until he was like 35. Marcus gets the job at Notre Dame. James wants to get into it. Perfect little segue there. And then he figures out he can come home, uh, work at Ohio State, which, again, if you have him, Tim Alton, and Brian Hartline on your staff, that's as good of a recruiting trio as you're ever going to find uh, in the history of Ohio State. Because James, 
if you give him a title and he's officially on the road, he will kill the game in recruiting, especially on defense. But he could recruit anybody because he's a guy colorblind. He can go to any high school, recruit any position, talk to any kid, and he'd kill it. But, you know, the Woody Hayes puts out these incredibly stupid narratives. And, you know, these beat guys will say, I'll, I'll see this stuff and I'll be like, really? A guy that's that old with three kids doesn't really know if he wants to be into coaching. Because coaching, you don't dip your toe into coaching. You dive head first off of the high dive and you're in coaching because you can't do it. You can't get half pregnant when you're a football coach. Like you're either in or you're out. Um, and he is head first in like he, he wants to be a head coach. He wants to be a coordinator. Like, I mean, he doesn't want to be a GA as a 37 year old. So again, I, I, we, there's no one on in this universe that destroys stupid narratives that come out of what he is the way we do, because they say stuff that just doesn't make sense. And when, when they tell it to people that don't understand football, then they just go with it and they parrot it because they feel like they're doing people a favor. But that's not our MO. Our MO is to bring the truth and the scoop. And that's what we do. And again, there's a reason why we're the number one Ohio State podcast and it's not even close because we don't do that kind of stuff. Because again, you guys want you guys want the real stuff, what's really going on, and that's what we're good at. Uh, Richard Good, thanks for the deuce. Appreciate you, my man. A laptop computer with work on the screen. Um, is that... Uh, Oh, guys, that's an emoji. I literally just read out what an emoji said. So appreciate you, my man. <laughs> I literally, I was like, I was like, I was like, what? You, you guys said this stuff sometimes. I was like, what does that mean? Oh, that's an, that's an emoji. So cute. I, I got, I got, a, I, got a, I got a super sticker. I didn't know what that was. So there you go. You guys can run that one back because that was pretty funny. I literally read out like a, a thing. So thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, Ethan Baker, thank you for the 10. Watching from Wasion. Going to my first Buckeye game this year, I feel like this team is going to be special with so much talent coming back and all the portal additions. Going to be an amazing year. Nevada, how great is this year about to be? Uh, it's the most excited I've ever been. I'm just telling you, it's the most excited, yeah. the, the most anticipation that I've ever had. Um, it, you know, it's a combination of just you know, the great talent, the great incoming talent, and just the hunger. The fact that we've had three, I mean, it's been a while a long while since we lost three tiers in a row to Michigan. And in two of those years, I know they were cheating. And I, I just want to beat those guys so badly. And I just can't wait to get into the season and the expanded playoff and to be able to watch the games knowing that we're not going to have a season stolen from. I mean, this is the point that people, and I've made this point before, but I want to make this point again. Like, I'll just use this one season as an example. And there's probably you know, 50 others we could point to. But like 2018, we lose one game at Purdue. And that keeps us from being the national champion. Went 13-1, and one, win the Rose Bowl, do the whole thing. But we slipped up at Purdue. Lost. That, that, that happens, right? Well, mm -hmm. this year with Michigan, they were cheating early in the year. And they were getting it at Rutgers. And they were cheating and managed to pull it out and pull it away. But, but if they weren't cheating, how do we know they don't lose that game? How do we know that all those September, October games that they were playing – that they didn't lose one of those games along the way. And all of a sudden, they're not the national champion. That's why they've got to vacate those games. That's why they've got to vacate this championship. Because they were cheating at that time. And so they can talk all you want about the big games. Oh, they weren't cheating against Penn State. Oh, they weren't cheating against Michigan. Well, it wasn't the big games that cost us the national championship in 18. It was the little ones. And those count as much as the big ones when you get the L on your thing. I, I, that's why I think that Michigan is going to get hammered. I think all their... their uh, their victories up until the time that counter stallions was uh, dismissed in early November are going to be vacated. And that's why I think the national championship will be vacated this year. They won't, they were not going to award it to, to Washington. There just won't be a national champion for this year. I'm that I'm calling that right now. I'm telling that's what's going to happen. Totally agree. Totally, totally agree. Eddie Phillips. Thanks for the 20. Appreciate you brother. Thank you for always being on here and kicking it with us. Uh, thank you, Burke Carton. See, I love that people call me Burke now because of you. That's amazing. And Bavada Nuck. See, I'm going to start calling you that. That'll be my get back uh, for your great daily entertainment. Yeah, the Burke Cart. I don't even know where that came from. I don't know if that was like, that was going to be like our like Vegas alias. You're like, oh, I'm going to call you Burke Carton. So no one will ever be able to guess what your real name is. So I'm like, okay, like you're going to call me Burke Carton. Like that's the dumbest name I've ever heard in my life. But it's stuck and you call it every day and people call me that in super chats now. So. I uh, appreciate you, Eddie. Uh, Nevada, uh, your uh, thoughts on Eddie. Again, the, the great daily entertainment. Again, we really work hard at this, man. And I'm telling you, we go every night. And this is the best part of my day. 
I get jacked up. Like I get ready to go play a game. I, I blast music in the house, get ready to go. And I just love doing it because I love kicking it with you guys. You guys bring great questions. And again, that energizes us because it's the difference maker in our entire program is because you guys make it a big show. Cause you guys come up with great stuff for us to talk about. The org chart question was amazing. Uh, thoughts on Chip Kelly and Jim Knowles is amazing. And you guys really bring it. So we appreciate you guys just as much. Nevada, your thoughts on us providing a little bit of entertainment every day. Well, Bert Carton, I I just did that so you could remain anonymous and so that we would keep this stuff. I wasn't attributing it to you. Just like not his real name, Bert Carton. And uh, I didn't think people would see through it. I didn't see the people figure it out as quickly as they did, but but they did. And I, I apologize to you for that, Bert. That's that's the best though. They they'll never ever get it. They'll never get they'll it. Never, they'll never figure it out. <laughs> Francis Plum, thank you for the five. Any news on the cheating scandal? OSU is building the Death Star. I totally agree there. Uh, the UN have to step up at the halftime for human rights violations in November. I think so. We're gonna be there, and we'll be like you know we'll be like Julius Caesar in the Coliseum, just clapping along as these guys go out and get murdered. Nevada, any updates on the cheating scandal other than uh, winter is coming? Yeah, no, they're supposed to be a, a, an update in two weeks from the NCAA to the Big Ten. And that's typically when I get a little bit more information. So um, I'll let you know as we get more. But, you know, they've been trying to keep the Big Ten in with regular communication about what's going on. And as I get that, I will uh, share it. I'm, I'm still, I said March, April timeline for the uh, second letter of allegation. I'm still sticking with that. If I hear differently, um, I'll let everybody know. Yeah, I, I absolutely totally agree. And I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be awesome. Again, that'll be a day that we'll be celebrating. And I can't wait to do that podcast because that'll be that'll be a day where we're heading to B dubs and we might be doing that one live. Um Pooh Beard 12 again. You know what it is, man. Uh thanks for the five. Appreciate you being an ultra member as well. They expect one of us in the wreckage, whether Harbaugh to Sharon Moore. Literally, that's what it's like. Like this is the scene, and you guys have all seen this Batman movie. It's like the best Batman movie ever with Bane. Where the plane's going down and you know Bane's got a parachute out and the other guy's got a parachute and he says, Nope, you gotta stay and die because they expect one of us in the wreckage, brother. And that's Sharon's got a lot of money to be in that wreckage, but hey, it's about to be ugly when he comes to the shoe. I think this is this is other than the one two game, this is gonna be maybe the most anticipated Ohio State Michigan game that I can remember, just because we have so many amazing seniors, and this is such a loaded team, and there's so much anxiety and angst, and it's Chip Kelly's first Ohio State Michigan game and Trey Henderson's last game in the shoot and Sawyer and JT and Will Howard and you know Quinshawn and uh Emeka, all these guys that came back. That, that, that has a lot of juice to senior day when you've got a lot of big time seniors that decide to stay instead of leave. Um so I think this will be as, as hyped of a Michigan game as I can remember because now it's now it's it's time to to get that get back. Uh, Tim 67 Buckeye, thank you for the ultra or being a scoop member, a scoop ultra member, excuse me. Thank you for the 10. Kirk, you make this look so easy every night. I don't care how much we do to make this work. You are a pro, bro, genuine dude that helps others. Hats off. Well, I mean, it, it is you, honestly, you guys make it easy because, like, if me and Nevada didn't have, you know, a great group of people, again, I like to, I, I've been calling people the scoop family for a long time, but you guys are the scoop family. You guys show up. You guys have a good time. You guys, you know, I, I mean, television honestly kind of sucks now. So there's not a lot of good stuff to watch. So we try to create something that you guys can watch every night with your, with your kids, with your spouse. Um, you know, you can learn some stuff. You can ask questions. So again, you guys make this easy. This would be hard if we show, if we did this and nobody showed up, that would be hard. That would suck. But you guys make it fun because again, you guys are hilarious for one. You guys are very, very thoughtful when you guys come up with these questions. You guys take care of each other. We've got a great culture on here. Um, you know, we've got Devin and Tora who are absolute monsters in the chat, and they they keep the chat clean. They keep you guys nice and safe from dumb trolls who we just get rid of immediately. So again, it, it's all you guys. Like this isn't me. This is like you know, I can sit here and talk to nobody, and this show would stink. But it's all because you guys show up and you guys make it fun. And again, nothing makes me happier. Then when I hear the the dynamics of people that like to watch the show together, when it's you know uh, couples, husband wife, when it's hey me and my my son, uh, father daughter, like whatever the dynamics are, is unbelievable to me because that's like something that you, you never think of initially. You do this, you think it's going to be mostly you know dudes, you know, older dudes, but it's turned into like a family friendly show and a gathering place. So again, 
I love that. I love the chat. Again, Tora and Devin are like a godsend. Those are, are two of the best guys. Devin is Ohio 7715. Um, two of the greatest guys of our salt of the earth human beings that have really helped and stepped up with the chat stuff because you know they're they're running the chat while me and Nevada are running the show. Um, and they're just awesome dudes. So again, we appreciate you. Um, Nevada, your thoughts. Uh I, I think it's it's all it's all the, the people that show up make this entire show. But your thoughts. Well, it's just it's just kind of the future of what we think you know television is gonna be about. It's gonna be about you know, community and interaction. And, you know, it's not, this isn't just one way. This isn't just us taping a show and talking to you about what we think is important. It's about responding to what you guys think is important. And, but having said all that, Kirk is real, Kirk is really good about at this. Oh my I, God. I, stop. I, I, I tell Burke Carton, Burke Carton. And I, I, Oh my I God. Tell, I, I tell them all the time. Jesus. This, was really, this was really what he was. I mean, he's good at it. He is good at it. Oh my and God. It, he, he makes it easy because he's kind of the, uh, the the ringmaster of the circus with all the uh, the characters in it. But uh, yeah, it's 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 fun. We have a good time doing it, so it's fun showing up and doing it. It's not work. It's not work for us, and that's why we enjoy doing it. If it was work, I guarantee you, I wouldn't do this. But this is yeah. fun, so I I love having fun. I'm like the elephant that stands on the beach ball, and then you're like the guy that's got the whip that cracks me if I fall off the beach ball. That's probably not more. That's probably more you're, you're thinking in your mind. The the ringmaster. I'm the guy getting the end of the whip from you. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy Moore, thanks for being an ultra member. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for the five. So in year one, how will it be determined that we can host a playoff game at the shoe? Ooh, I think isn't it the first? Okay, so the first four. You know, it's, it's a twelve team playoff. I think the top four get a buy, um, and then the next eight play. Like you know, if it's top four get a buy, so it'd be like five versus twelve, six versus eleven, seven versus ten, uh, eight versus nine. And I think that in in that round, I believe that the higher seed will host the playoff game. So five will host twelve. I believe that's how it works. That's how I believe it to work. Now, if I'm wrong. You guys can yell at me and shout me down. But I know that, you know, you really want to get into that top four so you get a bye. Because, again, the thing about a bye week in football is you can't lose and nobody can get hurt. So it's always good to have a bye week if you can get it. Nevada, is that how you believe it to be? No, that's that's how it will be. That That is the but, higher seeds, host, host the games, one through four, get a bye. And then, you know, once you, you know, go to the round of eight, those go to the, the more traditional sites and – you know, the more kind of neutral site games type of thing like that. But uh, for Ohio State, you know, it's it's a situation where, you know, I mean, Gene Smith was actually talking about if we oh, were God, five, five, five through eight, that we would oh, host God. that game in another stadium. And I, I I can only imagine that that thought has been dispelled and been put, thrown away to the island of misfit toys because um, I don't want to I don't want to hear that idea again, um, because if by something we have the misfortune of slipping up and being a five through eight and we're hosting a first round playoff game, it better be in the shoe. But that's, that's my thing. I, I mean, and he, he, he has done some exceptionally dumb things in his tenure, but saying that, like saying, you know what? We don't want to host a game in the shoe, which would be maybe the biggest, one of the biggest tickets other than you know the biggest Ohio State Michigan games ever. We want to drive three hours to Indy because we're so soft that we're scared we won't be able to run the ball and our in our in our fingers might get a little cold, skin might get a little cold. Our 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 constituents in the stands might have to wear a winter coat or something. I'm just like, it's just so dumb. I'm like, dude, like if we got our first home playoff game and you were trying to f- move us three hours to Luke Soil, it's not a home game anymore. It's a neutral site game. Like, dude, like there would be I couldn't imagine the intensity and the excitement of the horseshoe in December in a playoff game like that would be the most incredible I and mean, that'd be like christmas and new year's and halloween all i mean it'd be spooky it'd be fun there'd be hot cocoa it'd be awesome so again if we get to see a home playoff game i'll do anything i can i mean that'll be the greatest thing i've ever seen like a winter game snowy because you know we all have these fantasies in football of an SEC school from LSU or Bama or Georgia or Florida coming up to the shoe in the winter, like in cold, cold Columbus, snow on the ground, white walkers walking around tailgating outside, drinking beer. Like, I think that would be 
amazing. Because again, you know, we always have to go down there early in the season or they only come up here in September when it's hot. But imagine them being forced to come up here and freezing to death. And they all got to wear the long johns and they all got to wear the long sleeves because they're softies. But I want that. I want to see like the Florida Gators or the Miami Hurricane, whoever, come up to the shoe in December and just freeze to death. Because I think we all kind of want that. You know, because again, they... They don't come up here in the cold. They refuse to because they're scared. But if they're forced to, it'd be amazing. Uh, Jeremy Moreland, thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. Um, oh, I already got you. Sorry. Apologize. I'm on to Devin. Uh, Devin, my man, Ohio 7715. He has Scoop Ultra and he's got the wrench. Uh, he's a regulator. So thank you, brother. As always, great talking to you guys today. For you guys that don't know me, Tora and Devin talk. Tora is Akeem. We talk all day about how to improve the show, what to do better, continue improvement. Um, and these guys are like brothers to me now. We talk all the time. So I appreciate you, my man. Appreciate y'all a lot. Kirk in Nevada, you guys bring it every night. It's going to suck having to wait this long to see the Buckeyes play. Um, we're like 200 days away from the Akron game, so we're getting pretty close. Uh, can't wait for the Scoop merch. Are you comfortable with our depth experience if Will goes down? OH, Nevada. I O. I am. I mean, again, I think that, you know, I I'm a big believer in infrastructure and... Uh, being, you know, the quarterback being incubated by great players. I think the O line is going to be better. You got two first round running backs. You've got Emeka, you got JJ, you got Ennis Tate. Like, I mean, you know, and, and again, if, if say Do Doomsday, say Devin Brown transfers out, I'm getting Julian Sane ready to go as, as the backup. And I love Lincoln. I think he's a great kid. But Julian Sane is a first round pick type talent. And I'm just, I'm just saying, hey, let's go. I mean, you're, you're a developed kid, you're a smart kid. He's been really, really good in the workouts. He can absolutely throw the crap out of the ball. So that's my backup. So again, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe how could an 18 year old do it? But we've seen, I mean, you know, Quinn yours was an 18 year old when he was starting at Texas and he did really good. You know, so if you train him up and coach him up, like, and you get those kind of mechanics, like he already has, I'm ready to rock with him. Nevada. Uh, are you comfortable with the depth? Uh, if we'll go. And again, the last thing I'll say before I hand it off is that, you got to remember, I had someone say something really dumb to me the other day about the Cotton Bowl. I'm like, look, if any team in the history of football gets down to their third quarterback in a game, it's, it's going to look terrible. It's going to look like vomit on the film. So, you know, if we get down too far, it's that no team can survive losing three quarters. I know we did it in 14, which was an anomaly because we had Cardell back there um, when we lost Braxton and then we lost, um, you know, JT. But Cardell was the backup all year. It wasn't like he was the third string guy because Braxton got hurt during training camp. So Cardell took a lot of reps with the starters as the backup. So he wasn't like a true third string guy. Lincoln was a true third. Because when you're a third string guy at Ohio State quarterback, you're playing scout team. You got to go give the defense a look of what the, the current opponent is doing. So you're not really a part of what the offense is preparing and doing. So that's just the reality of it. So if all of a sudden you have to go play, especially if you're a freshman, it's going to be ugly. Nevada. Are you comfortable with our depth and experience at quarterback if Will Howard would go down? Knock on wood. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I am. Now, obviously, that's subject to change, as you said, because with the portal, you know, things can change in an instant. But, you know, to your point about third-string quarterback, imagine what Kansas City would have looked like last night if they had to go to their third-string quarterback. I mean, they they wouldn't be uh, talking about trophies right now unless, unless uh, San Francisco was similarly afflicted. But, uh, no, I, I like our – I mean, look, our quarterback depth, is as good as it's ever been. And there only as many guys as ever. Now, will it be that way at the end of spring ball? It's unknowable. I think so. But let's keep our fingers crossed on that. And, and I do want to mention something. This is not a 2024 thing, but a future thing. But Tavion St. Clair, man, that's a good looking kid. I don't know if you watched his ah, tape or anything. Yeah. He is, he, he's a good looking kid, man. He's a big kid and he can throw the ball and, uh, Guys are raving about him. I know, you know, people are kind of sleeping on him for the future, but he's a uh, he's a good looking prospect, and it's going to be a heck of a battle with him and Sane when they get it going on. Yeah, there there was a big one of these. You know, they do these quarterback competitions like every month. Now, was a big quarterback competition out in Vegas. He won the accuracy um, award. You know, again, he's got a lot of upside. Again, the easy pick I think would have been Ryan Montgomery. Ryan Montgomery is obviously not coming to Ohio State now. Tavion St. Clair I think has a higher upside than Ryan Montgomery. So. I think, again, Ryan Day got a good evaluation there, and he took a guy that I think is really – he could potentially be a top three-ish, four-ish quarterback in in this class of of 2025. So, again, kudos to Ryan. He picked the right guy, and I'm uh, really excited to see what he can do. 
Um, Mark Bundy, thank you for the deuce. Bosa and Chase Young played well. Yeah, I mean, they always do, especially Nikki. You know, Chase, um, you know, I know Chase got dogged out because he had a couple plays where he was dogging it. He was lazy, but I think he's just nervous about his next contract. You know, I mean, these guys in these playoff games, they're basically playing for for nothing. They're playing for beans compared to what their normal salaries are. And you see that sometimes when guys are up for free agency. Like, I mean, Chase is going to be an unrestricted free agent. I doubt San Francisco tags up with a franchise tag because he just, I don't think he's um, playing up to that number because that'd be like a $20 million cap hit for the year. And San Francisco is pretty close to capped out. Um, but yeah, Nick, Nicky is one of the top five DNs in, in the NFL easily. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what Chase gets on the market. Nevada, your thoughts on Nick Bosa and Chase yesterday? Yeah, I thought, I mean, they were dominating the game. I thought that it was going to be one of those. Um, like that Super Bowl a few years ago where Kansas City had lost their tackles and just got kind of dominated. I, you know, they were starting to take over the game. And it, the, look, the game really flipped on that muffed punt. You know, the punt where oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, it, you it literally it's like one play up until that. San Francisco was in complete control, and then it just flips. Like just football's a funny game sometimes. It can be one play it turns the whole thing. But um, that was that was a huge one and. Um, I felt like, you know, had that not been that Nick Bosa very well could have been the MVP of the uh, of the game because he was dominating at that point. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, when a situation like that happens where you have a, a hold-up guy, a hold-up guy's guy who's blocking for the punt returner, like, the punt returner, like, has to use his big boy voice, and, like, Jaden Ballard was terrible about that. Like, I mean, you got to scream at these guys to stay away from it's a wild stadium. you got to yell poison or Peter or whatever to get away from the ball. And the guy didn't do it. So you know, it bounces off his ankle. And that literally might, it probably cost the 49ers a Super Bowl, honestly. So again, that's, it's a treacherous situation, but you better, if, if there's something like that, you better go try to field it. Cause again, that was a, that's a devastating, devastating turnover. Uh, Cause they scored, they scored, uh, I think your boy Valdez Scantling scored the very next play. And uh, the Chiefs were dead up to that point. Geo did it 42. Thank you for the 10. If you really think uh, about it having Chip Kelly's or OC, uh, has to be absolutely terrifying for every place upcoming season. I love it. Go Bucks, dude. That's a great thought. And again, I again, like we literally were talking yesterday. Like, if you had to build your dream coaching staff for college football, like I don't know who I'd pick over Chip Kelly at OC. I, like, I really don't. Like, I mean, I, I mean, you know, my DC in like a dream dream scenario, my DC would probably be Kirby Smart. Uh, but at OC, I don't know who I'd pick over Chip Kelly. I mean, I mean it. I mean, I just I don't. I don't know who's a brighter offensive mind. I don't know who's more innovative. I don't know who's more um, scary to go against. And again, the thing about Chip is he's always done it with B tier, C tier talent. He's never done it with A tier talent. He's never got. He, he's never had like a a monster game. You know, it's kind of like like Urban Meyer when he was at Utah. People were like, "Well, his offense won't work in the SEC," and you know, he because he did that power spread and he shredded teams. He shredded Pitt. They went undefeated. Um, and then you know, he goes to Florida and then he can get the, you know, now he can get the A tiers He can go get Percy Harvard. He can go get Mar Marquise Pouncey and, uh, Mike Pouncey, the hall of fame level guys uh, across the board, Tebow, uh, you know, top five national five-star quarterback. Um, you know, chip is basically kind of like urban, except he never left Utah because Oregon is kind of like a, there is a little bit above Utah, but I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a state with no in-state talent. Obviously they, they, they're a very, unique brand because of how much money Phil Knight's dumped into it to make them unique. But I, I, I just think that, you know, chip running an offense with a tier talent with top of the line talent is going to be really, really interesting and really fun to watch. Cause he's never had a guy like JJ Smith. He's never had a guy like, um, like, like Quinn Sean and Trey Henderson. He's never had those guys. You know, he has that Zach Carbonate. He, he'd be our third string tailback this year buying Quinn Sean and Trey, you know, and, and Carbonate went second round to the Seahawks. So Again, I'm excited to see what, what he's going to do with, with true elite talent uh, across the board. Nevada, your thoughts on Chip? Uh, is it going to be unfair this year? Well, look, I, you and I were talking about this earlier today. You and I, the, I mean, the one thing you guys can believe is that Kirk and I are on the phone all day, every day, or texting oh with, with people <laughs> from all over the place oh. about just about stuff. Like in my other jobs, I just talk to people about stuff. Some people are Ohio State fans. Some people aren't Ohio State fans. Some people hate Ohio State. doesn't matter. I talk to them. I have not talked to a single person who doesn't believe this is like a moonshot hire for Ohio State. And I asked Kirk the same question. I go, Kirk, have you talked to anybody 
that doesn't think that this is like great. Just be honest, tell me. And he's like, no, Nevada, not, not one single person. So I can tell you the rest of the world is in awe of what's going on here. So this isn't just Kirk in Nevada sitting here going, oh, this is going to be great. You know, Chip Kelly's really good. I mean, everybody's terrified of what's going on. And um, I, I, like I said, we have 200 days to the act. You know, I'm, I'm counting it down, but it's only a few more days to spring football. And we're going to get a glimpse, and and that's going to be fun. So buckle up. Totally agree. Uh, Jeremy Morton, thanks for being an ultra member. Uh, Thanks for – you got another one in here. Uh, So when we go – oh, thank you for the five. So when we go to the Big Ten, will we play our starters and play hard or lay off for playoff as we go for it and look forward to it? I think we're going to play hard. I think – and again, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but I think the only way to play football is to play hard. Play to win – let the chips fall. If, if someone gets hurt, that's fine. Now, if it's a blowout and someone gets hurt and he's a starter, that's different. But, you know, I think if it's a Big Ten game, I mean, you're not going to rest guys for the Michigan game. Only that. You got to stay sharp. Again, you got to you gotta play. And the only way to stay sharp at football is to play it at a high level, uh, which includes Saturday. I never want to miss a game. I want to start every game. But I also wanted – I didn't – care to finish the game because like you know if we're up by 35 points like i don't want to play anymore like put the young guys in because again i think for the for the improvement of the program and and the continuity of the program going forward those young guys need to get out there and prove they can play you know they can't just sit there and wave a towel and eat sunflower seeds and you know hope to be ready next year they got to go out there and get in the fire a little bit and and make some mistakes again like you know you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna have bad plays and you know, you need guys to make mistakes in the horseshoe in front of our fans because, you know, our fans can be kind of meanies. And, again, I didn't mind it because, like, I like you – know, the thing about me, if you want to learn one thing about me is, like, I love accountability. So if you play like crap, our fans are going to let you know. If you play great, our fans are going to let you know. So if you don't, you know, want people to care, then go play at Akron or go play at Miami of Ohio. And, again, there's nothing against those schools, but they don't have, you know, 50 websites that cover them and 100 podcasts that cover them and – you know, diehard fans that cover them. So, you know, if I played at Miami of Ohio, nobody would have ever known I existed because they would have watched me on TV every week. But when you played Ohio State, if you have a bad play, they let you know. And again, I love that. So I think that you play them hard. Um, but I think that resting the guys and getting the guys out after it's a blowout is imperative just because it is going to be a very long season. And you got to remember, this isn't the NFL. You have 120 guys on the team. You don't have the NFL. You've got 45 guys that are dressed on game day. So, you know, when you're at a home game in the horseshoe, we got 120 guys standing there. So put some of those dudes in Nevada. Your thoughts. Are we going to play hard the whole way? Or are we going to laugh a little bit for the playoff? Well, kind of tangentially, what I'll say is if I have a criticism about Ryan day and I have very few, but I have a few, it's his unwillingness to, you know, it, it, unwillingness to rotate guys and it's kind of tightening up in some of these games. And I think Chip Kelly being there is going to be such a great impact on him because it's going to allow him not to get as tight because Chip Kelly doesn't get tight in the big games. And so this thing about seeing Ryan, you know, bad Ryan, tight Ryan, I don't think we're going to see it. And Ryan has vowed that he's going to play more guys this year. And that was part of his exit interview process with players, players that asked him about that. That's a point of contention with a lot of guys on the team that are looking to kind of say, hey, look, I'm not going to play this year. Because last year, Coach, you, d- you didn't play guys, and he has vowed that this is going to happen. So I think the combination of of uh, Chip Kelly being there and Ryan Day kind of continuing to evolve as a head coach, I think we're going to see more rotation, and um, but not resting. I think we're going we're to go after these guys because you want to get one of those top four seeds because, as you said, top four seeds can't lose in the first round. Uh, mm-hmm. and top four seeds are, are undefeated in the first round, and uh, undefeated is good. Yeah, I mean, it's like in, you know, when you play like a fantasy football, like you want to get the bye week because then there's no chance that your team's going to take a dump or someone's going to get hurt or whatever. And again, it's also a great chance to uh, avoid an injury for a week and and rest your guys that are beat up, especially late in the season. Like that'll be a guy like that top four spot will be an absolute godsend because there's going to be some guys beat up that might not have made it into the game for that first round of the playoffs, but they'll be ready to go uh, with a week's rest and a week's of recovery. So that'll be huge. Uh, the course, think of the five, brother. How does one become a GA? Great question. Also, uh, saw the show last night and wanted to offer anyone who mentions the scoop $50 off uh, my at IV Drip Business, the Drip Bar. So the Drip Bar, for uh, those of you that are in uh, Columbus area, 
is in Gehanna and New Albany. Uh, it's one three five two North Hamilton Road, Gehanna, Ohio. Gehanna, as we should say. Um, so check out the drip bar again. If you guys have never had an IV before, they're absolute game changers. I love taking IVs. I always feel amazing afterwards. So um, really, really good business. So uh, take care of our, our guy there. Appreciate you, brother. Um, becoming a GA is is kind of a it's an interesting process because I, I get asked that a lot because I was a GA. Um, I was lucky. You know, I, I play. Obviously, it helps. You have to have a connection. You have to have it in. It's really hard to just walk in somewhere cold um, and just become a GA. Uh, you, you know, especially at a program like in Ohio State, because they get a thousand applications every year for the four GA spots. So it really is kind of like a needle in the haystack. Um, if you're willing to work for free, uh, that helps. You know, when I so the, how I got into coaching when I you know I was just looking for something to do. I got cut by the Denver Broncos in training camp. Um, I didn't want to play anymore. I was good on football. I had a nice career. My body was shot. My knee was atrocious. Um, you know, I had. I'd have microfracture on my knee. So I was done playing. I was like, I feel like crap. I don't want to play anymore. It's three years in, but my car, I was like a beat up old car at that point. So I called Tress and I said, coach, I don't know if you have a spot for me or anything I can do, but I'd love to help out, um, kind of learn the ropes of coaching a little bit. Um, and he was receptive to it. And he said, well, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make you a quality control coach. Um, and you, you know, you start tomorrow and we're not going to pay you until November. So if you're any good for the first, like, whatever, three months or two, it was like two and a half months, we're not paying you anything. So you got to show up every day. You got to work, prove it. And if you're good, we'll hire you. And if not, you know, you're good. So I was good with it. I was fine. I got money from the NFL for a few years. I was straight. I wasn't eating ramen. I was living good. Um, and I literally worked every day. I worked hard. I worked long hours. Being a quality control coach absolutely sucks because – you can't legally coach. Now, I know a lot of programs across the country that don't have, you know, a 50-person compliance department like Ohio State, the, 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 the QCs are out there coaching their face off and working, and, you know, it's all in the dark, so nobody cares. But at Ohio State, if you're out there and they catch you coaching, they're going to fire you, or they're going to suspend you, or they're going to write you up, or whatever. So, you know, we practice right across from the Fawcett Center where the compliance office is, and they sit up in the towers, and they see us, and so I had to stand there like an idiot, and I was like, I just want to be a GA so bad because if you're a GA, you can coach legally. You can be out on the field doing everything that the top nine coaches at the time, now it's the top 10 coaches, uh, can do. So the next year, I decided to become, I asked, I said, Coach, I really want to be a GA because I want to coach. I want to actually like, get my hands on these guys and work with them and talk to them and teach them because you legally can't do Like Joe Philbin legally cannot coach during practice or during a game. So when you see him, and Devin Jordan and some of the quality control coaches on game day, they don't even have headsets on, which would drive me crazy because, like, you can't even get to play if you don't have a headset on. So, again, you know, I, I, I had at least had a headset on game day when I was a QC, but to be a GA, I think you just have to go and show up and work. You know, I mean, I, I talked to Mark Pantoni about it, and when he showed up to Florida, he was an unpaid intern, and he did that for years, and he did whatever needed to be done. He set up tables, took out trash, took people to the airport, made copies. It's not all just like glamorous. It's not like you just get to sit there and evaluate five stars and write scouting reports. Like you have to go do a bunch of grunt work, make coffee. I made a lot of coffee, which again, I was fine with. Cause again, you know, Urban Meyer made coffee. Jim Trussell made coffee. So it's like, I can make coffee. Jim Trussell told me a great story when he was at Syracuse and he was a young coach in like the third quarter, he used to have to take a car to like for road games. He would have to take a car to the local chicken shack and pick up the, the the meals for the team. So that's how important he was on the totem pole as a young coach. He's like, I had to leave the game in the middle of the third quarter to go pick up all the chicken dinners that we fed the players after the game. So again, when someone like Jim Trestle tells you a story like that, you're just like, well, these guys have paid their dues, so I'm fine with it. So basically to be a GA, you have to have a good connection. Maybe you could start off as an unpaid guy at Ohio State. Um, sometimes if you're a GA at a lesser program, uh, and you and you do good and you get good referrals, you could get into Ohio State, but it's tough. You see the guys that do it, a lot of former NFL guys and a lot of guys who had connections in the program. But that that is a fantastic question. I know it's a long answer, but it's uh it was a blessing because I got my MBA out of it and then I got out of coaching and got into business. So it worked out great. But it is uh that's probably one of my most asked questions is how do you become a GA? Because 
every young person who wants to get into coaching wants to be a GA at Ohio State, and it's it's exceptionally hard to do if you, especially if you don't have a big connection. Uh, Donald and Karen Ros uh, Rosbeck, thank you again. Uh, a great married couple that are watching the show every night. Uh, thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. The big house is now called the outhouse. It stinks up there. Totally agree. Nevada, how bad is the big house about to be this year after, um, God, man, they got to have Texas. Texas is coming a week too, man. They're about to tax them. Yeah, it's 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 going to be bad. It's going to be just, just, but, you know, for Michigan fans, you, you got to remember, I mean, they're used to this because they, they weren't very good. I mean, think about how bad they were during the COVID year. They were so bad during the COVID year that they tapped out their game against us. They wouldn't play. They literally refused to come play the yeah. game. So, you know, it's not so long ago that Michigan was bad. So I think for Michigan fans, this is going to be kind of a regression to the mean. You know, this is what they're used to. And um, so I, I I mean, I'm not sure how much of a change it's going to be for them. I think these, these years were the outliers, not the other way around. And um, I mean, that's what happens when you don't recruit nationally well and you have virtually no recruiting base locally and your staff leaves. Um, it's going to be lean times, but couldn't happen to a better bunch. No, I, I totally agree, and I'm uh, I'm just I'm thrilled that they're about to be in a very painful predicament. Uh, Ted Nahas, appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the five. Hear a rumor that Edwards, I assume that means Donovan Edwards, wants to leave Michigan. Just chasing a bag. Go Bucks. Michigan sucks. I, I'm telling you, like for for Colson Loveland, him, those D tackles. You know, if they're not buying what Wink Martindale is selling and what these new OCs is selling, like why would you not at least try the portal? And see what your 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 market value is, because I mean, I know what like Caleb Downs got, you know, and like Colson Loveland is not Caleb Downs, but he's a guy that you get him for a year, you've got the best tight end probably in America on your team. So is he worth three fourths what Caleb is? I think so. Um, I'd at least look, you know, because again, do you want your last again? I've said this a thousand times. Do you want your last thing memory at Michigan to be fifteen and zero with your your forty four seniors and Jim Harbaugh and all your boys? on that stage, hoisting the trophy, confetti everywhere? Or do you want it to be like getting absolutely dog walked by Texas and Oregon and Ohio State and going to the, you know, the filet of fish bowl or whatever? Um, I just, I would at least look, you know, because again, there's some real valuable guys on that roster. And if they hit the portal, man, those, the bags of money come flying out of the sky. But uh, your thoughts about uh, Donovan Edwards? And again, Donovan Edwards has a business decision to make. Because like, dude, if I'm a running back, and I'm looking at that team, and they got to replace all five offensive linemen. Outskis, your thought on that? Well, I think Donovan. It's just kind of a, a larger extension of what we were talking about earlier, which is it's a bad situation. They all know it. Uh, nobody wants to be the real first prominent guy to jump. Um, but we've all seen. We've seen this like in business. You'll see companies where the you know people stay at a company for a long time, and nobody leaves, and then one guy leaves. And then all of a sudden, 50 of them leave. And I, I've seen that so many times in my professional life um, that I, I just know that's what's going on with Michigan football right now. And Donovan, I think Donovan sucks personally. Um, him and his 3.4 yards per carry or whatever it was. And I remember people were like, oh, I'll take Donovan Edwards over Trey Henderson. Like, yeah, right. No, that's not a good idea. But um, that might be the smartest thing he ever does is, is get out of there. And I don't think he can get out of there quick enough. But um We'll see, but I I, I def, absolutely think it's going to happen. And I think once the first prominent guy goes, watch out. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, I mean, Colson Loveland jumps in, man. I'm not, I mean, again, they, they're they losing like 17 starters or something crazy and, and a lot, and a ton on offense. They're basically losing everybody except Colson Loveland on offense. So I'd be out skis. Coconut Dream, one, two, three. Thank you for the 20, brother. Appreciate you being on here every night. Uh, I agree, Nevada. Plus, how many games or scum was up big? Set out the starters after, the, say, the third quarter, which might have prevented them from getting injured, which might have totally changed their season. Hashtag cheated. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. You know, they, they pulled a lot of their starters, and a lot of it was probably because they were cheating and they were up by huge scores in the first half. Um, I think it helped them. Nevada, do you agree the cheating helped them uh, get big leads and rest of their guys? I mean, there's no, there's no question. I mean, there's no, again, just, if, just for fun, go back and pull up the Rutgers game and watch the <laughs> halftime interview with Greg Schiano. Greg Schiano is literally losing his mind with oh, the yeah. halftime reporter. 
He's ready to just burst. He can't even control himself. And he watched that first half, man. Rutgers was right there, punch for punch with Michigan, and could have given it to him that day. But, you know, that, that cheating makes a difference. Uh, it, it helped them in many, many different ways. Um, and I, I, I do not know how you can't vacate those wins. I, I just I, I can't imagine a path where that happens. No, I, I totally agree. Uh, shot clock, Todd. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my friend. 2024 Weasel game was the most anticipated since 70. Woody literally prepped all year for only that game. Payback for the upset of the century in 69. Uh, you know, again, I'll always be biased, and you guys can call me up, but like the 06 game where it was one versus two was pretty wild. Um, but preseason, it didn't have like, you know, we knew we were going to be preseason number one. We didn't know how good Michigan was going to be because, you know, in 05, Michigan lost like they were like eight and four or seven and five or eight and five. Like they they had like five. I think they had five losses. So people didn't project them to be like the second overall team in the country by the end of the year, which they ended up being. Um, but, yeah, this is going to be this is going to be a wild one because I think that our fan base has a lot of bloodlust and they're bloodthirsty right now to get get that pound of flesh back from Michigan. And this team is going to be exceptionally good and exceptionally talented and exceptionally deep. And you got Chip Kelly to the mix across from Jim Knowles and it's going to be fearsome. And, and you know, again, this is going to remind me of like the 08 game where Michigan just had no chance. I and mean, they absolutely dog walked in Rich Rod's first year. Um, and I think that's because it's going to happen here. Nevada. Uh, is this the biggest Ohio state Michigan game since 1970 in terms of uh, people getting uh, the anticipation up in February? I, yeah, I think the preseason hype, that's probably right. Um, yeah. you know, as you as you mentioned, in 06, they weren't ex- expected to do much. That game ended up being the biggest. But, uh, yeah, 70 people really wanted it. But, I mean, I yeah, the Ohio State fans, they want it all. And, look, the losses to Michigan was a big part of why a lot of these guys returned. I mean, it was a big part. I, I, know, I, I know we compliment NIL, and I, I'm not trying to make it sound like, oh, they're all just doing it for the team. I know the money helped. But, like, I can tell you, Jack Sawyer, when he was talking to those guys, they want to right a wrong. They don't like the fact they've lost every year to Michigan, and that does not sit well with them. And uh, when you combine overwhelming talent with motivation and great coaching, wow, uh, we're going to see something really special that day, and I, I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be – that'll be a magical day in the shoe, and I hope to see all of you guys there because it'll be absolutely awesome. Survive the hunt. Thank you for being an ultra member. Uh, love your AVI. Um, loved watching a Bose and Young play together last night, which we've got to see it in Columbus. Happy Monday, God bless, and go Bucks. Yeah, that was that was hard. They were here the same year. Obviously, Nikki had the oblique thing. A lot of money on the line. Second overall pick in the draft. Um, you know, obviously they made a business decision to hold themselves out. But yeah, that was uh, that that was like one of those like what could have been moments and. We've had a lot of those in the last like seven or eight years. Guys that, you know, like it's kind of like Jackson Smith and Jigba, guys that get hurt, uh, guys that opt out, whatever. Um, it's been tough. But yeah, not seeing uh, Nikki and Chase, because Chase, I don't, Chase is not the same guy since he tore his ACL um, that he was in college. In college, he was absolutely ferocious. Um, so yeah, we, we really, I mean, honestly, that's the year we win the national championship. If we, if we have those two side by side in 18. Um, your thoughts on not getting to see Nikki and uh, Chase? Uh, together well look I, I you just talked about you know we didn't get to see Jackson Smith and Jigbo we didn't get to see Nikki and Chase together in college we get to see all that this year we don't you know like yeah. we don't have to go man I wish we saw Trey Henderson one more time in Columbus or wow what if what if JT Queen and Jack came, yeah. came back and ran it one more time or a Mecca yeah. with JJ Smith we get to see all that <laughs> we're gonna get to see it so it's like you would ask, why am I excited? That's why I'm excited. That's why I'm excited because I feel like I've been robbed of some of these moments and I feel like I'm getting them all back this year. Like for every year that I was robbed of not seeing it one more time or running it back one more year or unfortunately, I get to see it this year and I'm so excited. I can't stand it. So that's why I'm so geeked about 2024. That That's the reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be phenomenal. Um, and again, I call him Nikki because I've known Nikki since he was a ninth grader. You know, when when Joey was getting recruited, he was a senior at Aquinas. Like little, I'll never forget uh, John Bosa and uh, his and and Nikki's mom. They came up, the four of them, 
Um, and, and, you know, the parents are divorced, but they're very amicable when they were going through recruiting. And I, that was the only defensive player I ever, I ever paid attention to or gave any interest in was Joey Bosa, because those guys had just, you know, a lot of the staff had just gotten here. It was spring. And so it was Vrabel, Fickle, me. Um, I was rolling out with those guys because I, I really hit off with John Bosa. John Bosa is a fanatical trainer. He's ripped. And I was like, I was really, really big and strong back then. Uh, and, and like, I just, I really hit it off with those guys and I loved Joey. Joey's one of my favorite players ever. Um, and Nikki, it was funny because Nikki was so small, but like he had giant hands and he was like a puppy dog with giant hands and giant feet. And his dad was like, he's going to be way better than Joey. And I was like, dude, like Joey Bosa is the best defensive end I've ever seen in college other than Jadavian Clowney. And, uh, he was right. I mean, Nikki, like I mean, through the beginning of the NFL career, I mean, Nikki's probably reached a higher tier than Joey. And I love Joey. Joey's a big physical monstrous guy, but it's just so great seeing the Bosa have success because they're a great family. And I love Joey and I love Nikki. And it's, just, it's so funny. Cause like, I just remember him as like this little ninth grader that was, he started varsity at Aquinas. Um, and he, he was dominant too. He was really good as a ninth grader and they played, I want to say they played Don Bosco out of Jersey, who's like one of the best programs in the country. And Aquinas killed him week one. Uh, we were all watching it in the in the in the hotel with the team, just because you know they, we always put on a game and we were like, "Oh, Joey's playing." And Joey, I think it. I don't think if he'd committed to us yet, or he was going to commit to us, but you know, it was it was just fun watching those two just wreck shop because we knew Nikki was coming too, and Nikki is a absolute beast mode. Um, chocolate chip. Ha <laughs> ha, Scoochie, my man. 199 from, he changed it. You're the best, dude. I'm good saying, uh, starting saying three or four games, he's legit. Saying's the future now. I mean, Julian Saying is really talented. And that was the beautiful thing. It's like Bill O'Brien was here for like three three weeks and he got us a guy that he had at Bama who's probably the number one quarterback in the country. He passed Dylan Riola. Um, yeah, so thank you, Bill O'Brien. Appreciate your brother. Um, but I love, I love Julian Sand. I love everything about him. His film's impressive. I love his, his makeup. And again, it's not just me because I'm not a quarterback guy. I'm a line guy. But the people I talk to that I trust that know quarterbacks say this guy is the truth. So it's just getting a little bit better every day in Columbus, folks. Nevada, your thoughts on Julian Sand? Yeah, he's really good. I mean, he's really, really, really impressive in camp setting. He's really, really impressive in game setting. Seen him in both. And, uh, yeah, you, when you watch him, you you don't have to be a quarterback guru to know that you're watching something really special. When you see him throw the ball, he he can he can do it all, and he just looks the part. And yeah, he's going to be great at Ohio State. I totally agree, Vince Diana. Thank you for the fifty. Appreciate you, brother. Congrats on all the success. Remember watching you and TJ from the sidelines. You guys were built different. Uh, played in the Woody a few times for lacrosse. But what do you want to see for a new facility and where do they put it? That is a great question because the Woody Hayes is landlocked and some of the land that they could have done it on, they built a new, I think it's field hockey stadium uh, that's right next to the Woody. So the Woody, you know, I think the only thing they can do is eliminate one of the football practice fields um, and kind of build the front of it. Like there's that, there's that one field on the end that we don't really use too much. It's a grass field. Um, I think that's what they were initially projecting to do with the architects is turn that into like a giant weight room, then turn the weight room into like office space and maybe throw a second floor on the court. What do you, cause again, like we don't have coaches office that are just for the coaches. Like all of our coaches offices, the players are in too. So like if coaches need to work and they don't really have anywhere to go, if the players are loitering around in the watch and film in their offices. So that is an issue. Um, but that's a great point. Uh, yeah. TJ and I were different cats now when we played, cause we were about, we were about that action and, you know, you need some some wild guys out there. You don't need all church mice. And we had a lot of church mice, but you need some some San Antonio Holmeses and some guys like, you know, you know, some guys that are you know, a little rough around the edges. And you know, again, it's a good it's good to have a blend. You can't have all, um, you know, guys like, you know, some of us. And you have all guys that are softies because if you have a bunch of softies, you're going to get ran through by good teams. So uh, we had a good blend on the team and I credit trust for that. He really had a good culture. Um but yeah, the, the Woody, it'll be interesting to see if they if they take that last practice field down and they turn that into the weight room. I think that's what they're trying to do. But, you know, they, they can't raise enough money, which I know that sounds funny when we break all these records for revenue, but that was the big issue is they want to, it's like one of those things where do you want to really do it right, right, and spend more money? You know, a lot of you guys have, have built houses, have bought houses, have, 
you know, redone houses. And it's like, you know, there's, there's always like a scale, like, okay, what do, what do we really need? What would be like really luxurious? That's kind of like where they're at with the Woody and they need more money. I mean, they need more people to donate for it. And frankly, I think that something that really angers me is people have given money who are diehard football fans. I mean, I've, I know people that have given $5 million to Ohio State, diehard football fans, and then the money ends up going to like the lacrosse stadium. So, you know, if I'm like the athletic director and someone's a diehard football fan and they give money, I'm earmarking it for the Woody Hayes athletic facility renovation. I'm not saying, oh, we get to go build, you know, an equestrian field or something with it. But that's one of my issues. I'm like, look, you guys got to figure out, you know, do you want to take care of the horse that drags everyone else along? Or do you want everyone else to have a new building except for football? Because that's my opinion. And and I'm right. Um, your thoughts, Nevada, on uh, needing a new Woody Hayes? Yeah, I mean, the plan is to build it within the footprint of the existing facility. And, and you're right. I think it'll be a combination of taking over that football field and going up. But they're not planning on relocating. I haven't seen anything that would indicate that it would be moved to a new spot. I think they're just going to try to, you know, you know, you know one way to think. You can always get more ground is by going upward, and I think that's probably what, yep. that's probably what they'll end up doing with it. Yeah, because you could put a, a second floor on it and, and put the coaches' offices up there, and I think that's probably what, what the move's going to end up being. Um, Survive the hunt. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my man. Loved watching Bosa and Young play together last night. We could have, <laughs> well, we could have got to uh, see it more in Columbus. Happy Monday. God bless. Go Bucks. Totally agree. It was fun seeing those guys and. It'll be interesting to see what Chase's value is on the open market because, you know, he's had moments where he's looked good. Like, he obviously had that sack last night, which was great. But, you know, his film has not been great the last few games. I don't even know if San Francisco is going to offer him, like, a real contract. They might make him a lowball offer, but he's probably going to hit the market and to see where he's at. But, you know, he's he's kind of a guy that's at a crossroads. And I, I love Chase. I think he's a great kid, great player. But, man, when you have that knee injury and you don't have the same explosion you used to, it costs you. You know, and that's why – you, you see when you see guys like hold out and you see guys like, you know, like, like JK Dobbins wanted a new contract and they said, Oh, come play. And he shows up and he blows his, blows his wheel. I don't know if he tore his Achilles or his ACL like week one. Like that's why these guys hold out because like, if they do blow a gasket, then all of a sudden you're not going to have the same burst that you used to. Some guys come back from it, but a lot of guys don't. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just, I hope for the best with chase and I hope that he can get back to being where he was uh, at Ohio state Nick Grillo, uh, thank you for the five. First offense versus first defense. Who wins? Love to hear about the Joel Penton story of play at high school football. Ooh, this is a juicy one. Uh, Nevada, in the first scrimmages, first offense versus first defense, who wins? Uh, I'm going to say the defense. I think defense, offense takes a little longer. I mean, offense is about coordination and, you know, synchronicity and doing things like that. And defense is just about blowing stuff up. And um, I think defenses generally, when you're got equal talent, they'll they'll start out ahead of the offense. Um, but that'll that'll be that'll be fun. It'd be great, epic battles to watch as we go along. Totally agree, uh, Joel. Uh, Joel and I want to guess each other a lot. He was a uh, year older than me. Um, he was a guy that I'd send into orbit on a double team because he wasn't real strong. Um, and I, I I I crushed him one day in practice. I don't know if this is winter winter practice, and you know, I, I kill him. Uh, me and TJ killed him on a double team. And like, I'm walking back to the huddle and I get jacked in the back. And like, you know, I lost, I mean, I lost any point of sanity at that point. Cause like, if someone shoves you in the back, like there's no, there's no bigger, like, you know, I, this is a feeling there's no bigger, I don't even know what the word is, but I know what all the words are. I don't, but I can't say any of them on this program because we're family friendly. But like, if someone pushes you in the back after you kill them, then that's not okay. So, you know, I blow a gasket and I go after him. And then like afterwards, like I remember Jim Bowman, I forget, he said, he said, why are you such an a-hole? And I, and I was literally like, let's watch the film and see if I got, see what I, what did I do to instigate that? I killed him and then he jacked me in the back. And again, you know, I, I'd be a lot more colorful if this wasn't a family fun, but it was like, that was, that might've been as mad as I've ever been on a football field because like, you don't, you don't do that. Like I never started a fight. It's like, I always say about with me in Nevada, like we don't start wars, but we do finish them. You know, so if people want to go to war with us, you better you better say a prayer because when we come through, it ain't gonna be pretty. Um, and I think people have found that out. But you know, with this, I was I was hot. And again, like you don't, you know, I never started a fight on the football field. I didn't have the energy for it. But we fought, 
you know, if someone wanted to fight, I'd fight. But I, just, I wasn't into starting it because, for one, I was always scared I was going to break my hand. You know, if you break your hand as an offensive lineman, it's terrible. Um, and, and plus, like I said, I just I didn't have the energy for it. I, I mean, I went against guys like Cam Hayward and Vern Golson. And, like, you know, I had a respect for those guys. Like, I'm not going to fight them. Like, they're, they're my boys. Um, but we got after it pretty good. But I never fought Cam or Vernon because um, those are my guys. Now, we went after each other hard during the play. But, you know, we weren't guys that were going to, like, swing on each other. It's kind of like in hockey. Like, there's some guys that fight and a lot of guys don't. Like, that's – I was a guy that, like, I didn't really feel like fighting. Unless unless someone wanted – you know, if they wanted to try me, it's different. But I'm not out there. Like, I wasn't out there being a punk. And that was a total punk move by Joel. Um, so, there. There's a little way back machine story. Uh, Zach Holgerson, thanks for the deuce. Did OSU offer Tommy Reese prior to Kelly or Bob? God, no. <laughs> I mean, that is – I mean, dude, guys, he's the tight ends coach for the Browns now. Nobody wants him to be the offensive coordinator after that debacle at Bama last year where he was terrible. Um, Nevada, you laughed. I'll let you talk because I just had my little diatribe. But Tommy Reese is the offensive coordinator would be about. That would be the most underwhelming hire in my lifetime uh, for an offensive coordinator. Yeah, it's just the, the Internet's great. Somebody can write something down and people just like it just gets repeated. And it just kind of goes on. But no, there's absolutely no true. Tommy Reese was never even under consideration for the job, let alone offered it. Yeah. Like, like, like you got to understand, Ryan Day, you know, to, 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 who, to whom much is given, much is expected. And, dude, they want him to give that play sheet up. And we've had the most loaded roster ever. It's national championship or bust. And do you think Ryan Day – is going to trust Tommy Reese with his livelihood and his coaching profession to call plays after watching that Alabama Michigan game. There's no chance in the universe. I mean, no. So Chip Kelly is different now. So that's why I had to go get a real dude. You had to go get Bob or, or Chip. Uh, Tony stop. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you. What is your prediction on how long before we, we see an NIL cap per sport watching from Omaha, formerly from tip city, Ohio. Great show. I think, you know, I, I've heard very conflicting stuff on this from a very, 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 very high source at Ohio State. Um, I think they want to pass something around May. I don't I don't know how you cap it, though. Like I, I think if you try to cap it, it goes right back to being the Wild West of beforehand where, you know, with Ohio State, it was like, you know, oh, we don't we have no bag men. Because if you cap it, then the bag man just shows back up. So I just don't know how you implement a cap because, you know, you can always make more money elsewhere. It's kind of like in the NFL, like Odell Beckham makes a fortune in endorsements off the field. He has a really good salary, but he also makes a ton of money with him from a bunch of different endorsements. So I don't know how you cap in a free marketplace someone's earning potential. But again, that's just me. Um, it could happen. But I know that the NCAA is working to make a resolution um, potentially around May-ish is what I was told. Um, but Nevada, can you cap this? I mean, they opened up Pandora's box. You can't close it now. Well, no, but, you know, we've both heard the same things. They're trying to. I just don't know how it's legal. So uh -huh. um, what I would say to you as a listener is there are very smart people that believe you can do this and, they're, and they understand how crazy this is and they're trying to get some sanity going on. I'm just telling you as a non-legal observer, but a guy who's, you know, real, you know been, been through some proceedings, understand how it works. I'm just not sure how they can do it. So, uh, but people are, it's, it's actively being looked at. They, everybody knows, everybody's in on the joke. They know that this is not sustainable and it, it's not a good situation, but I'm just not sure what to do about it, for the, but they are working on it for sure. Totally agree. Keem the dream, treasure the Torah. I missed you, my brother. Uh, the wrench is active. Uh, the ultra is active. Uh, treasure the Torah is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. I appreciate you so much, brother. I missed you early in the show. Just want to send a very special message to all the Buckeye Scoop family in the chat. I am so happy and appreciative for the love and support you show me every day. Kirk and Nevada Buck are true blessing to be with you all sincerely. Dude, to keep you're like one of the, the, the nicest human beings. I mean, you got to understand, like, I didn't know you until I started the show. This is kind of the beauty of like doing a show like this and Buckeye Scoop is like, you really get to know everybody. It's like everybody kind of shows up. We kick it. Great questions. Really smart audience. Really great people. And like, you know, offline, I've really, you know, I give my number out to all you guys. I give my email out to all you guys. You guys can barton.145 at gmail.com if you guys haven't saved it or need it. If you guys ever need anything, hit me up. But uh, dude, you are a humongous part of our show. 
uh, along with Devin, who's Ohio7715. Uh, uh, you guys really kill it in the chat. I appreciate you, my man. You work so hard. Um, and we talk and text all the time. So I appreciate you guys. Like, if you saw our group text, they're absolutely hilarious. So I appreciate you, brother. Again, thank you for the 50. Uh, I'll hit you up after the show when I'm doing some editing. Uh, and we'll talk about, uh, again, how we can show improve and how we can also... You didn't say it today, but we'd also say strapped and stay golden. That might be on a t-shirt. Uh, Chocolate Chip Scucci. Again, thank you for making this a family-friendly name. Uh, appreciate you, brother. Pray we stay as healthy as we did this year. I think we will. I mean, I think we've got, you know, again, you can never fully pre prevent injuries, but we've got a great sports science program. Mickey, as much as people dog out Mickey, I'm like, dude, Mickey, we have more whistles and gizmos and therapy and cold tub and plunge and... I mean, we have cryotherapy. I mean, basically, I don't know how any of these guys ever get tired or hurt with all of the regenerative stuff that we have in the Woody Hayes now. Because it's like, it's literally like a high-end spa. And I'm like, God bless. I wish I would have had all that stuff. Because I would have used it all. I love cryotherapy. I love, I was, I did cold plunges before they were cool. Like, I, I love all that stuff. I love the water treadmill, the zero gravity treadmill. We have everything you could ever dream of. So I think we'll be healthy. Again, I think they put a lot of work into that. Um, and so, but sometimes you just get stung. Like sometimes it's just, it's just bad luck. You know, some teams get, you know, like Tom Brady tears his ACL in 2008. Like it was a low hit and I don't know how you can prevent that. I don't know if you can do more stretching to prevent a guy going low and blowing your ACL out. Emma DeLuca at 907. Thanks for the deuce. Will Chip have the wide receivers block? Well, I don't know if you guys watched the Niners last night, but the Niners wide receivers block really hard. And I think Chip's got to get after these guys a little bit because he wants explosive runs. And, uh, Here's the deal. You can listen to me and say, Kirk, you can hope and dream and whatever. But Chip Kelly led the nation in rushing two years ago. And the only way you lead the nation in rushing is if your perimeter guys, i.e. your wide receivers, are getting after those corners and those safeties, especially the safeties. If you go running interior running game, you're running in you know, by the, between the guards and centers. If your line blocks everybody, you need someone to dig those safeties out and go put a hat on those safeties. That doesn't mean you need to kill them. But if you just get in the way and you've got you've got guys that run four three like Trey Henderson, then you're gonna go to the house. And again, I think that our our perimeter blocking has been atrocious, and that's why we don't have as many explosive runs as we should. With a guy like Trey, Trey is like literally he's Jameer Gibbs. He's that type of guy where if he gets in the open field, he's out to the crib. But if there's safeties unblocked, then there's too many guys back there that he can't get around. You know, you can only get around so many guys. But if you get again, and that's why I put Ennis in there. I mean, Ennis will kill those guys. Say, Brandon, we're going to throw you the ball, but you got to go take some of these guys' heads off. And again, um, you know, <laughs> Kyle Shanahan, and I, I picked up Collins where I said this last night. He said, you know, their philosophy in the wide receiver room is no block, no rock. So if you don't block, you're not getting the ball. So again, I love that because I think that that's the best way to play good team ball on the offensive side of the of the coin. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an area where we really need to show improvement. Nevada, will our wide receivers block this year? Well, I mean, if you look at his teams, they've always done, they've always blocked well on the perimeter. So, yeah, as you mentioned, you don't get to be number one in the country in rushing without having that because you need those explosive runs to crank up those stats. Nobody did it better than UCLA two years ago. Uh, Chip's teams have been renowned for how good and how relentless their, their outside guys are at blocking. So I have no doubt we'll improve on that this year. Uh, totally agree. Jeremy Moreland, thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for another uh, great um, $5 donation to pay it forward. I was stoked about Aaron Nolan, but all I hear about is Julian Sands. I like uh, the way he, Aaron, stays firm and he stays firm and seems a true Buckeye. What gives? Nevada, I will let you take this one because um, I'll let you take it. Aaron's struggling. Air struggling a little bit, struggling with some stuff. Not going to go into it more than that, but um, I just, I hope he gets it together. Uh, I'm confident he can. Not the first kid to go through stuff like this, but he's going through some stuff. And until he he figures that out, it's going to be hard to really be you know, pimping him or jumping up and down about how good he is because he, he's immensely talented. The kid is unbelievably talented. Lo loved him in high school, got some stuff, but he's got some stuff to work on in college. And I'm rooting for him to, to get it together and not really comfortable saying more than that, but that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. And, and again, I'm, that's why I let you go first. So again, um, you know, he's, he is a great kid. 
a lot of really good feedback from him from uh, the South Florida Express guys. He seems like a great kid, true Buckeye. Um, but yeah, he's going through some things right now. So again, we leave it at that. Um, and we have Julian saying now, so, you know, it, it's, it's not the time to not be on point when the number one quarterback in the country ends up transferring here after Nick Saban retires. So leave it at that. Um, Alan Dietrich, uh, thank you for the 10 at 55. I love that. Cause I now know what that's from, uh, was confronted by a scum fan this weekend while wearing my black V hoodie. Uh, he told me I'm gonna make a four straight error. So I smiled big, turned around, and walked away. O H Nevada. I O I O. That's the worst part about honestly the the winning is like I, I I see more Michigan stuff now than I'd seen in 20 years. I mean I see it everywhere. I see Costco. I see it you know at at, at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. Like they're just because again for 20 years it was like we exterminated the cockroaches, the termites, the the varmints. You know like we killed them all because again. When you beat them to death, like we did, you know, like 19 out of 20 or whatever it was, they don't wear their stuff anymore because they're embarrassed because they know that if they go around Ohio wearing it, it's going to be like getting tormented. So we got to get back to that because, you know, them dog walker, even if they cheated, they still won uh, and they won the national championship and all that. But we're going to get that switch this year. But again, that was like a driving force to me is when you're a kid that grows up in the 90s in Ohio and you see all these douchebags that wear Michigan stuff because... The Fab Five's cool. Charles Woodson's cool, and we suck, and we lose every year. No matter how, no matter how good we were in like '95, '96, we still lost to Michigan somehow. Like with Eddie and Orlando, and all of my heroes were sad at the end of the year because they lost to Michigan. So, like when I actually get to play here, I, like I always remember that, and I was like, God bless, I hate these guys so bad. So when we beat them, I always loved it. Man, I couldn't wait to fire up a cigar, get me a Crown and Coke. It was amazing. So. um, that was like my senior year was I was a basket case. Cause like, I can't imagine my last game playing these guys losing to them. Thank God we won. Cause like when you walk off the field as a senior captain in Ann Arbor and you beat them, you're just like, this is as good as it's going to get. This is the best feeling in the world. And uh, I never have to play these guys again. So it's the best thing ever. Um, but yeah, I, I can't wait to get back to uh, eradicating the idiots that wear Michigan stuff in the state of Ohio. And again, and I am not scared to say that to those people either. Cause I don't care. Beach Buck, thank you for the 10. Appreciate you, brother. I call in a fine bomb to support a Buckeye Nation among <laughs> the comers in the SEC. It pains me to listen to uh, TM or crappy beat writers represent us on his show. Will you be our voice on that show or others? I mean, I don't know. Like, I think fine bomb, he's got a shtick and he's kind of a legend down there. Um, you know, he's known Tim for a long time. So, again, I, I, I get why Tim goes on there. Uh, cause you know, these beat, right. So these, I mean, Tim's been a donor for like 50 years. So his ties run deep down there, but you know, I'm not hard to find if they want me, but I don't think the problem like with having me on is they don't want the truth, you know, and they don't want like, you know, like edgy content. Um, and again, I like where we're at in our market. We do a great job. We appreciate you guys being a part of what we do. Um, so I don't know, I'd, I'd, I'd sacrifice Nevada to go talk to Feinbaum. Nevada, would you go talk to Paul Feinbaum, the mouth of the South? I mean, yeah, but like you said, they, they they don't want to hear from us. They don't want to hear the truth about SEC football. They don't want to hear the truth about Ohio State football. So uh, I think that I'll, I'll put that into the category of uh, things that are probably never going to happen. That along with Jessica Alba calling me up and telling me that she's <laughs> dumping Cash Warren and she, she made a horrible mistake in the movie Into the Blue and it should have been me. Um, yeah, these are things that are never going to happen. It should give you all of the stock in her honest brand that's worth like billions of dollars as well. Uh, oh, oh gosh! I, I want, I want that too. If you could, uh, CW, thanks for the ten. Would the NCAA take action against a UM player if they have direct evidence that the player is involved in the cheating? That is a great question, Nevada. I'll let you take that. Um, well, I, I've never really well, thought of that. They, yeah, I think they would. It's just you know you got to understand. Michigan knew they were cheating, so they knew they were cheating from the very beginning. Now, they were still inelegant and ham-handed, but I, I doubt that they directly involved the players in any way from any electronic trail standpoint. I mean, the only guy that you really could have done that with was Corum in his, I didn't know I owned a piece of this LLC thing, which was the, I, I, I just don't have any words, um, but he's gone. So there's really not much you can do against him. Uh, Harbaugh is going to be made. Harbaugh will become the super villain that did all this and his claim will be that it wasn't him. It was stallions. That was this rogue agent 
that operated outside the law and that nobody knew what he was doing. And that we all know how they're going to try to spin this. Um, but I, I doubt that they'll directly be able to implicate a player because I just communication like that is just so infrequent. And um, I, I'm not sure how that would have uh, really played out. Yeah, that's insanity. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, like when you have that little intern on there and they're calling the plays off, like, that, like it's great that we have so many media people that cover Ohio State because they have those sideline videos of him like pointing and like, I mean, it's just so it's so damning when you see how obvious it was that these guys were calling plays off of those guys because they're down on the field calling the defense based on what he's seeing off the signals. And again, it was a really sophisticated operation. This wasn't like, hey, I looked over there and I think I kind of have. He's like, no, we have it. And they don't know that we have it. So, you know, again, it's like it's like cheating. It'd be like cheating at the casino, like in, you know, in the movie casino where the guy's got a little thing on his leg and he's tapping it and then he gets his hand broke. Like that's kind of what it's like, except on a way bigger scale because this is college football. This isn't a little casino. Uh, Lil Spend Daddy, thank you for the five for uh, for our future based off Chip's offensive scheme. Uh, he likes to run the quarterback, so start Lincoln because of the size of her. Nolan and Julian question mark. I don't know. I mean, I'm starting Julian over any, either of those two for sure. Um, Nevada, I think you're with me on that. Um, I, I think Lincoln's got, he's got a, this is a big spring for Lincoln. Now I mean, you got Julian saying sit behind you and Julian is no joke. Um, but your thoughts Nevada uh, on starting air or, uh, or um, Lincoln over Julian. Well, don't forget Devin. I mean, I like Devin. Brown well, yeah. A lot. I, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, frankly, I I was in the category that I thought that Devin Brown should have played more last year. So, uh, you know, we never really got a chance to see that in games, and and, I, and his game performance didn't match his practice performance. But I'm, I think he's much better than people know. Um, so don't don't sleep on him, and I I don't think he's leaving either. I I mean, he might he could he could transfer out tomorrow for all I know, but I've got no indication he's going to do that, and I think he's going to be in it to win it once Will Howard leaves, and he'd be my betting favorite. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Well, uh, good long show tonight. Uh, Nevada, any final thoughts? We'll wrap this thing up. No, just uh, any time that Michigan loses their top their top recruit asks out of his NLI and uh, their, a, a player transfers to Ohio State is a good day. The, the Michigan descent into darkness has begun and just uh, sit back and enjoy the show because it's only going to get worse from here. No, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing to watch. Um, and I think you know Texas week two is going to absolutely destroy those guys because Texas is loaded and they got a veteran quarterback. They're gonna have a new line, new quarterback. That one is going to be ugly, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, as always, we appreciate you guys kicking it with us. This was another great show. Thank you guys, another huge audience. So again, it's a great show because you guys make it one. So thank you so much. Uh, with that being said, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave us a like, click subscribe, also click that little alert bell so you never miss one of our live shows. We're gonna be going around seven every night. Uh, again, we appreciate you guys kicking it with us. Uh, shout out where you're watching from. I saw Northwest Ohio in the building tonight. Uh, my Southern Ohio boys are in the building tonight. Uh, shout out who you're watching with. Again, I love seeing the dynamics. Um, and just a little question. What are you most excited to see in spring football? Is it Chip Kelly's offense? Is it Julian Sain? Uh, is it, is it uh, um, Will Howard? Quinchon Judkins? There's a lot of new faces. Caleb Downs. What buzzy storylines are you excited to hear about? So we'll be getting that news for you. Uh, again, we appreciate you guys so much. I hope you guys uh, have had a great night tonight. Uh, about to jump on BuckeyeScoop.com. A lot of new news coming in. If you guys want the news first, it's always on BuckeyeScoop.com before any podcast. So if you guys are not members, uh, you guys should jump in. Because if you like this show for two hours a day, Buckeye Scoop is cracking 24 hours a day, especially the time where we're not on the air here. Uh, it's a great community, a lot of great people. I think you guys would love it. Um, and we have a we have a really, really fun crew. So that being said, thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. And thank you, Scoop family. We're going to see you guys tomorrow around 7 o'clock. Go Bucks.